Councilmember Martin. Here. And Councilmember Dabo Faring. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. All right, great. Just a quick reminder, uh, anyone wishing to speak during public invited to be heard, um, we'll need to go ahead and watch the live stream of the meeting and then we'll throw up the instructions. That one right there, when the time comes, you'll need to dial that number. So, all right, if we could take that off the screen, great. And then, uh, so let's go ahead and start with the roll call on the pledge, or sorry, the pledge. Why don't we go with Polly? Could you lead us in the pledge tonight? <laughs> There's a new, the mute section is in a new place. Um, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, of the United States, States, States of America. America. To the, to the republic for which it stands, we stand, one nation, one nation under, under God, God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty, liberty and, and justice for all. For all. all right. All right, let's go ahead. Motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items to future agendas. Anything? Dr. Waters? I don't want to add something. I just want to confirm uh, in the email we got from David uh, Bell earlier today, he made reference to uh, updating us during this meeting. I assume he's going to do that during the city manager's uh, report. Could we just confirm that? If not, I'm going to, I'll make a motion. No, co correct. Um, because Thanks. of the timing of getting an item on the agenda, he's going to yeah. update tonight and then we're going to bring another item back. Thank you. All right, great. See, uh, Councilmember Christensen. Go back to the old way. Um, <laughs> um, because this is a very uh, difficult time and also because we're changing our uh, director of public safety, um, I would like to have a report on by the uh, police department on what our public policy is on the use of force by the police force. I feel like we have a very good police force, but many, many people have been asking us for this, and I think we owe it to them to uh, have a report in a fairly short amount of time by the police, just a short report on what our policy is on the use of force. Harold, let's just go ahead and put that on an agenda, keep it to three to five minutes. I know mm -hmm. that it's on our website, but I okay. think that it would, it would take, It'll be. It'll take more time right now to talk about it and discuss it than than it would to actually get the report. So if we could do yep. that, it's just mayor's prerogative. Okay, great. Anything else, everybody? All right, cool. Let's go on to public invited to be heard. Let's go ahead and uh, wait to see who who joins us. Are we going to get the city manager report after that? Uh, yeah, I'm looking. Uh, that will be number four on the agenda. Special reports and presentations, COVID-19 update, as well as the LHA. Unless you want to go now. I don't care. No, I'm good. I was used to the regular. I'm good. Let's go another 60 seconds and then we'll cut it off. Is anybody in the queue yet? Mayor, we have one person so far. Looks like we have another, so we'll give him another minute, maybe. Peace to you too, Marsha Martin. Peace to you. I know what you're saying too. I'm just. All right, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Let's go ahead and cut off the public invited to be heard list. And let's start with the first one, shall we? Susan? 
Yes, Mayor, one minute. I will start the timer. Mayor, we have, looks like four guests. The first guest ending in 532. I'm gonna unmute you. If you could please state your name and address for the record, you have three minutes. Uh, I think that's me. Uh, yes. It this is Jim, okay, this is Jim Hollins. I'm at uh, 1400 Third Avenue. And um, I'm uh, calling about traffic situation in town. Um, I have spoken to probably over 100 people from 19th, 9th, Collier, um, down by the rec center, Spencer, Fordham, Mountain View, Hover, 17th, South Pratt Parkway, uh, Drake, Hover, over by the airport, Brock, Harvard, uh, 3rd, Maine, you get the idea. Um, and proof that um, the noise and the speeding all night long, um, that I'm not the only one. And um, that we're not asking for anything extraordinary. I think when I've talked to Tyler a couple times, he sort of gives me the sense that he thinks I want to stop all traffic or something. We, we are just asking for some help to mitigate the speeding and the noise. So like when we're in our backyard, we don't have to feel like we're on the speedway. It is really rough. It's really bad. Um, and we keep coming to city council. You know, all these people, if you look on the next door app, it's a hot topic of conversation. And um, the theme there is there is speeding. There are these people who are making all this noise. They have call, gone to city council, they have called Tyler, they've called the police, and our pleas for help are falling on deaf ears. And I, I don't know if you can hear that going by right now. I, I don't think it's too much to ask that we have, that people obey the law, and that we have some quiet in our own yards, or in the middle of the night. So here we are, and um, I, one question I have is I was looking at the traffic mitigation online that is dated 2006, and I'm curious if that is still valid or if it's been updated. We usually don't respond uh, during public invited to be heard. That's why you're hearing silence. We listen, but okay. And so, but what we can do is we've got your name and contact information. And Harold, can we shoot her an email with an answer? And I don't know if you're a computer, but we're getting a head nod from the city manager. So, uh, uh, do you want to share your email real quick? Um, Mayor, perhaps uh, it would be best if she emailed support dot web at Longmont Colorado dot gov. Did you this get that? One? Okay. Perfect. Email it and then we'll respond. Okay. That would be fantastic. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next. Guest 722, you're next. I'm going to unmute your uh, line. If you could please state your name and your address for the record. You have three minutes. Go ahead. My name is Lynette McLean and I live on Sandpoint Drive. Uh, I served on the count, uh, Climate Action Task Force, and I just wanted to request that a survey be sent to all of the participants in that task force so that we can give feedback on the process and the results. Um, and I just want to say a few things. At first, I was disappointed to see the composition of the group included so many city staff members. And later I realized that the staff members were able to provide much necessary information about the budget, the programs, and the services that were already being provided. But the group, group process, even though it was very pragmatic and functional, it was less than inspiration, uh, aspirational. And in spite of the COVID and the loss of several participants, after we were no longer able to meet, 
a document was created that appears unwieldy, but I hope that the council will be able to identify action items and measurable goals that they will be able to track. I hope that the council will make climate change a priority and they'll be able to identify those uh, climate action priorities um, and hold the city accountable to take action on this urgent issue. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next. Caller, your number ends in 820. I'm gonna unmute you. Hello, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, please state your name for the record and your address, you have three minutes. Thank you. Hello again, my name is Catherine Baylog and I'm calling in for the fourth time about short-term rentals in the city of Longmont. I live at 1920 Spruce Avenue. The house behind us is a short-term rental property. This um, house overlooks our backyard, their hot tub, their decks, everything in their backyard overlooks our property. Since early May, we have had different people or guests watching us and our children playing in our backyard. Every week there are new people vacationing and watching us. This is a privacy and security issue. The last time I called in, I brought up that this is a hotel in our backyard. Hotels are not allowed by zoning laws to be in residential neighborhoods due to the inevitable disruptions of tourism. Why is it okay that we have this hotel in our backyard? Big cities all over the country have protected the residential neighborhoods from those short-term rentals and from what my neighbors and I have been dealing with all summer long. City Council, can you please revisit the short-term rental laws and consider banning short-term rentals in residential neighborhoods so we can have our privacy and security and peace of mind back? Are you thinking about talking about this issue and please help us? Thank you. Our last caller, your number ends in 119. I'm gonna unmute you if you could please state your name hello there you are can you can you hear hi. us can you hear me yes hi hi this is karen dyke i'm at 708 hayden court mr mayor and council members when a group of us met to discuss asking the longmont city council to adopt a resolution for the coming climate emergency we had no idea how this would intersect with a worldwide pandemic. I realized that resources and plain old attention span are both strained with the pandemic. However, there are two main thoughts that I have about this intersection. The first is that we as a society need to understand the cost of not acting. Much of the misery of the pandemic could have been averted with a swifter reaction from our government starting with preparation for pandemics that was woefully inadequate. While we could try to list blame, we should start by saying, what can we learn from this that will help us with the coming climate crisis? One good example I can list is Longmont, working closely with Boulder County Health Department. This type of coordination at local levels will be needed and should be emulated. The second is to realize that the coming climate emergency will once again have health consequences. Our warming world will allow diseases previously only seen in the tropics to migrate to our area. Zika already proved that diseases can migrate. Just as this pandemic taught us that those at the front lines are most affected, people and places will once again not be equally affected. As you review the entirety of the report from the task force, please note that there are ideas to attempt to work on the cause such as that seen in the renewable energy suggestions, as well as those ideas to work on solutions, such as those seen in the public health section. Also, there are ideas on how to make sure we don't leave some residents behind in the section completed by the Just Transition Task Force. I ask that you not put off implementation plans. I realize that there is a currently a shortage of funds and also people power as we try to complete work through less effective means such as Zoom meetings. However, a recent article in the Washington Post gives the alarming report of warming in the Arctic that is occurring several decades sooner than predicted. As someone said, the pandemic doesn't care if we are tired of it. The pandemic hasn't tired of us yet. 
The same is true of the climate emergency. It will come regardless of how broke we are and how tired we are from the pandemic. Just as COVID-19 is alarming us with its severity, climate change will be much worse if we don't act in a decisive manner. I urge you to spend some time deciding on priorities, cost, and what can or should perhaps come from state or federal resources. Please don't just put this on the shelf. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Good, good timing there, by the way. All right, um, that will go ahead and conclude our first, or our, our only public invited to be heard session tonight. Let's move on to uh, special reports and presentations. Harold, COVID-19 update. All right, Mayor Council. Um, I'm gonna go over some numbers with you all. Uh, since that tin, everyone sort of wants to see where we are today. Can you all see my screen? Yes. I've got some issues with things moving around, okay. So um, this is the uh, most up-to-date, this is updated at four o'clock today in terms of where we are looking at the number of cases um, that were reported. Um, obviously, the, you can see the spike that Jeff was talking about the last time he was presenting to council. Um, this is the most recent number. This is 10. Um, and this is 15. So you can see that trend in terms of what we're seeing with number of cases. Um, when you slide down to the five-day rolling average um, percentage of COVID PCR tests with positive results, um, you can see that we came down and we were below that 4%. We moved up, moved up, and again, that's just based on the testing that's occurring, but we're still holding in that high three percentage range in terms of the percentage of positive tests. Um, this is when you're seeing the number of tests per day um, and that we're doing. And then the light blue again is the number of positives that we're seeing um, in terms of the county. Uh, again, you know, improvement from where we were. Then um, <clears throat> you can see the this is important because you really look at uh, the, the residents who in age range, and you can still see this 20 to 29 um, year old cohort um, with a fair amount that are um, um, positive. Um, again, the, the five day average of the number of new cases, and this is really what we want to see happening um, as we continue to move, in, move forward. And then, you know, this is based by, um, a municipality per 100,000 population based on um, projections. Uh, but this is the one that I wanted to show you all. We talked about this a little last time. So as you can see, the major change in this graph is that uh, Boulder has now surpassed Longmont in terms of 550 cases versus 542. Um, and I think that's important because if you remember, and it was um, what, three weeks ago, three to four weeks ago, somewhere in that range, um, we were double um, the number of cases that Boulder really had. And so, you know, this has been a, a significant change for the city of Boulder um, in terms of the caseload. Um, and talking to Jeff associated with the cases, I know there's been some questions regarding um, protect our neighbor phase and when can we move into that section of it. The, uh, the state has put some fairly significant requirements um, and um, the, the most significant is the data. And so you have to show 14 days of declining cases. And as you can see from that, we're still working on that, that 14 days. Um, you also have to have um, tracing capacity and you have to have the testing capacity. Um, and, and so they're continuing to work through that. If you all saw Jeff's update um, that Marika sent to you all today, they're working on a dashboard that will actually show where we sit in terms of a county, in terms of moving in to protect our neighbor. One of the questions that, that I've had as I've talked to staff is, well, can we do that as a community? Um, the state did not set it up that way. The state set it up where it has to be a county and or a region with multiple counties moving forward to try to move in to protect our neighbor. And as Jeff indicated, it's, it's a number of folks within the county that have to sign off on it. Um, uh, OEM, Office of Emergency Management has to sign off on it. 
city councils and mayors have to sign off on it, the county commissioners have to sign off on it, Department of Health. And so they're really pushing for that broader decision making as a county and a region in order to move into the protect our neighbor phase. Um, so that's really all I had to add there. I know that there were some questions on those issues that I wanted to touch on. At this point, uh, I'm gonna turn it on over to Sandy because um, she's been working on the motion that you all made in terms of the food tokens. And I wanted her to talk about how um, we plan on implementing that. Sandy? Thanks, Harold. Uh, Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager. And I'm here to talk a little bit about the Strongmont voucher program that we have branded based on the same Strongmont uh, language that we've been using for business assistance grants. So the way that we are going to work the program, um, we were able to contact the Chamber of Commerce who's gonna help us with the administration of the program. Um, and we also are working with Tinker Mills to be able to create $25 Strongmont tokens. We will mail those out with a, a letter um, with your signature that I think Marika sent you uh, early last week um, out to folks that are CARES recipients from the rebate program also folks that are uh, working in the community farm share program, as well as some of the kiddos from their, their families from the um, food distribution site from the youth center. So the 400 tokens are gonna go a long way to be able to give some food to folks that are in need in Longmont. Um, and then we also have 146 businesses that will be able to accept the tokens. So we're in the process of notifying them uh, and sending out the tokens. We'll start the program in late July and run it through the end of October. Um, a very cool story that I'd like to share with you is that uh, because of our partnerships with um, the Youth Center and Children, Youth and Families, we're gonna work with some of those neighborhoods to be able to bring in eligible food trucks so that people won't have to necessarily go to one of the restaurants. They'll be able to have some of those restaurants come to them. So it's gonna be a really nice program. I'm really excited to uh, go ahead and implement it. Thanks, Harold. Any questions for Sandy? Oh, Sandy, what else you got for right. us tonight, Harold? Um, so I want to talk to you all. Um, one of the things that we also talked about when this came up um, was the conversation on utility bills, and we indicated the state had a program. We also had the CARES funding that you all were going to look at. And so um, we're really hitting the point on utility bills where we need to start working with folks um, and ensuring that they're contacting us. Um, excuse me. Today, um, we know that we probably have about 2.9 million in um, utility bills that are past due. Um, what we were really waiting on in that process was trying to understand that legislation that the state passed in, term, in terms of the utility assistance program. We started getting that guidance um, late last week, early this week. So what the state's going to do is they're actually going to push that money into the LEAP program. And so individuals will have to go in into the LEAP program and get qualified. The interesting piece that we learned in this is that it's only going to be allowed to be utilized for electri electricity. Uh, it's not going to apply to water, um, wastewater, and some of the other bill structures. As we were looking at this, one of the things that we feel like we can do in terms of tag teaming this is when we look at the CARES dollars that we received um, that you all uh, voted on last week that we're gonna get from DOLA is we will look at taking the LEAP program as a mechanism for us to bring the additional CARES dollars. And I wanna be clear, <laughs> there's, there's so many CARES programs now. We have the CARES program that you established um, in terms of the rebate program. Then we have the CARES dollars that we're receiving, um, and they're the federal dollars that are being channeled through DOLA. So if somebody needs utility assistance, they need to, A, go into the LEAP program and get qualified, or if they're in our existing CARES program. We'll start there. And then if they're not in the existing CARES program, but they get qualified in the LEAP program, we'll then look at the other CARES funding that we have in place. If they can't qualify for either one of those programs, we wanna work with those individuals um, to set up some type of payment arrangement within our system. Um, and then finally, I think the challenge that we have is that we're really nearing the point where we're gonna have to start notifying folks to say, we need you to do a couple of things. One, we need you to contact us um, if you haven't been paying your utility bills 
because we want to connect you into the LEAP program and we want to look at connecting you into the CARES program or using the LEAP to connect you into the other CARES program. Um, <clears throat> at a certain point though, if they don't go into the LEAP and they don't go into the CARES program and they don't contact us to, to set up payment arrangements, and which we do on a regular basis, probably in the September-ish timeframe, October, after we have enough time to notify people, we're really probably going to have to start moving into our more traditional practices. So I think what we're telling you is there are a lot of programs out there now, or there are programs out there now that can assist people. We just need to really encourage people to, to go in and engage in those programs. And if nothing else works, we'll work with you on the payment arrangements. But if you don't do any of that, then we're really going to have to move to our more traditional processes. Um, and I know you all talked about different options. We think there's money in play. It's really getting folks to come in and access those programs. Is there any questions about that? All right, don't see any. Harold, anything else? There's one, there, I see one. Who? Councilmember Christensen? Peck. Oh, sorry, Councilmember Peck, way down there on the bottom of my screen. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, Harold, I was going to ask, uh, what, uh, what do we do? If, I, I'm sorry, how do we get this message out? Do you want us to go on social media to tell people about these programs, to go on next door, um, to use our email lists. Uh, is there any way that as council people, we can help you get that message out? That's my. Yeah. Sorry, it's cutting in now. All right, so yeah, so what we'll do is we'll work with um, our public information team and get you all information that you can share and, and what we need to communicate to people. We also, I wanna take them, as I, as I mentioned to this, I talked to you all about this uh, before. I want to take a more active role in reaching out to folks um, in order to establish that contact, that contact so that we can really get po um, individuals into the programs that they need to be into. Um, because one of the things that I'm really concerned about is um, we can't let individuals get themselves in a significant position where months down the road, we actually have more significant issues and it's almost impossible to get out of that situation. Right. And so while we have these programs available for people to get into, we need to get them into the programs so we don't end up in November with people, you know, having significant utility bills in the thousands of dollars and it's almost impossible to recover from. Right. And so we're fortunate right now that we have these programs, we just need to get people to go into them. Exactly, and I, and I think that I personally would like to help you get that message out. Um, we, will be, we will be in contact with all of you and getting you that information. Um, we still have some work to do on, on some of the state programs. We have enough now that I wanted to talk to you all about it today to understand what was there. We still want to understand some of the details to make sure we're porting people in a pro, into the correct locations with accurate information to make sure we know that. Okay, thank you. Councilor Christensen. Um, Harold, the, um, I know Jeff isn't here tonight, but um, I was reading something very interesting um, a few days ago. I was thinking, because I'm a woman, I'm thinking, oh, I bet all, women are getting this at twice the rate of men. Well, actually, uh, women and men are getting this at about this, uh, I'm talking about COVID-19, <laughs> uh, mm. are getting this at about the same rate, but men are dying at twice the rate. And um, I'm wondering if, which is, you know, really uh, appalling. Um, and a few weeks ago, we took a look at the rate that um, Latinos uh, in Boulder County are getting this at a much higher rate and yet the death rate is far far lower and those are interesting statistics I'm because you know if, if we don't gather these statistics and actually analyze them then we're not learning anything at all about how this works I'm just wondering if Boulder County Health is paying attention to trying to determine uh, why it is that Latinos fortunately unfortunately are getting this at a much higher rate, but also are not dying at, at, uh, at a dying at a lesser rate, which is a very good thing. But men, 
by and large are getting this, um, are dying at a much higher rate than women. So I'm just thinking that this is something Boulder County Health should be checking into. So um, th that is, um, it's interesting. So women do mm -hmm. have a, I believe it's a couple of percentage points higher in terms of cases. Um, men do um, are higher on, uh, on uh, passing away mm -hmm. um, when they get it. Um, I think one of the things, and we, and we have kind of talked about this, so when we saw the growth in cases in Longmont, one of the things that we really saw, knew was, in many cases, it was a result of multi-generational households. Um, and so oh. as we were looking at that, that was part of it. But one of the things that, that they've talked about, and I think you know, we need to really look at, is also the age of, of the individuals that are, that are getting diagnosed with True. the case. Because one of the things we do know is that uh, the younger the person, although that data is kind of changing now as they're seeing other things happening, but the younger the person, the more likely they are to have, you know, not have the same um, high level issues that you have with COVID. And, and so uh, it, what I would like to see as we're going through this is also the demographic breakdown by age mm -hmm. um, in these categories. To really see is, is it a product that we're seeing more younger people um, in, in, in these various categories being diagnosed with COVID, thus you're not seeing uh, the death rate and, and the hospitalizations at the same level. And so, um, because it's interesting, if you look at 15.5% um, is a new number of deaths in, in the Hispanic Latin X category, um, white non Hispanics is 80.3. Um, mm -hmm in terms of cases, 57.6 in the white non-Hispanic, it's 38.2 in the Hispanic Latinx categories. If you remember, that's actually going down a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and we think that's also a product of what we're seeing in terms of where the cases are coming from um, today um, in, in that you're seeing Boulder really start elevating in, ter in mm -hmm. terms of the number of cases. So I think those are all things we've got mm -hmm. to look at um, and we've got to talk about. and. Mm -hmm. I think the challenge, this is a novel virus. And so, um, you know, they're really seeing that. Interesting story was how people reacted this differently. There was a Tony Award or Tony nominated actor who was 41 years old yeah. uh, that just passed away. And, and when you hear about it, they said mm -hmm. his lungs looked like he smoked for 50 years. And so they're also finding situations where, where young people have different issues associated with it. And if you start reading through it, you know, one of the things they're looking at is that, is their immune system actually going on overdrive and creating other right. kind of problems with it, very similar to what somebody with um, eosinophilia occurs when they overproduce white blood cells. Right. Right. So I, I think there's still a lot that folks are learning and we're going to continue um, working on the data. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm slowly becoming more and more educated in epidemiology as we go through this conversation. Um, at this point, I'm going uh, really, <laughs> to turn it over to David because one of the things that council wanted, um, and, and you all directed us to do this, was a report on what's happening in our parks and open space. Um, that direction was last Tuesday. We wanted to get the agenda out, so we wanted to put David into this spot. Um, let him talk about what they're dealing with, um, what challenges we're facing, um, and then get some information from you all. And then we'll also then, um, if necessary, bring it back in a more comprehensive report when, when David and his group have some time to do it. They were also getting ready for the holiday, which um, they had a ton of work um, to prepare and get ready based on what we were seeing at our facilities. Um, David, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Sure. Uh, Harold, Go we didn't get a chance to really talk about how much time we had. So did you want to give me a quick little what you'd like to see us in? Scott and I can adjust pretty quickly. Just move with pace. Okay, you, I'll, I'll keep watching you and you can keep me moving. Um, Mayor Bagley and council members, David Bell, Director of Parks and Natural Resources. And again, as Harold mentioned, it asked to come and kind of talk about what we're really doing to kind of make sure we're managing our natural resources and our parks during um, this pandemic. And I feel very fortunate right now that I'm going to be able to introduce Scott Sievers, who is our first certified wildlife biologist for the city of Longmont. And he has been on for just over a year. 
and he's going to kind of kick this off with a little bit of overview of what he's been seeing out in the parks and kind of what the direct impacts have been to our wildlife. And from there, I'll kind of go into how we have been managing responses of what we're seeing from Scott and his group. Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, I just wanted to give you a little primer on wildlife, uh, uh, looking at both direct and indirect impacts. Um, and I'll just jump right into this. Direct impacts can be things like uh, flushing of wildlife through boat traffic, foot traffic, or dogs. Um, direct impacts might be nest destruction or uh, we've also had reports of people climbing on beaver lodges at uh, Golden Ponds. Um, indirect impacts, uh, that might be unauthorized trails like what we saw at Left Hand Park, uh, removal of vegetation uh, that might uh, indirectly impact wildlife in their habitat, uh, or off-trail use, um, again, like at Sandstone Ranch. So, um, you know, people are looking for outlets for outdoor activities during this pandemic. And of course, uh, having all those visits on our properties can um, impact wildlife. So what are we doing? Um, and so I'll talk about some of our current solutions that are in progress. Um, one of our great projects that's been going on for multiple years since Jim Crick was hired as your natural resources specialist is monitoring raptors uh, through volunteers and staff. And um, we have a great um, interplay in the natural resources team with the engineering team and projects that are going on on the city and making sure that our raptor nests um, aren't being impacted by city projects such as paving or a water project. And um, that's run successfully actually by a cadre of volunteers. And uh, we've allowed them with the managers, the city manager's office permission to continue to monitor raptors during this period because they're socially distanced, they're in their cars and they're giving us great information and feedback. And so far, all of our raptors did, are doing as expected um, quite well during this year. Uh, the biggest issue actually for the raptors wasn't people, it was the smart, the, uh, the Easter snowstorm, which took out uh, several nests. Um, uh, another big part of our project is restoration of habitats through weed control and native planting. And that has been a big part of our project. That's almost my daily project is removing weeds and making more room for native plants on our trail system. And my colleague, Jim Crick, this year said, it's the best he's ever seen. And I would encourage you, if you'd ever like to come with us, uh, we'll take you on some of our trails and you can see um, the reduction of invasive weeds and the native plants coming back. And that's been quite amazing. We've also had several really good establishments of native vegetation in restoration areas. Um, long-term studies of birds. Um, we have a long-term study of bird populations at Golden Ponds, and we have a long-term study of birds at um, Pichelle. And I intend, although, um, you know, the pandemic kind of got in the way, but we're going to try to add additional places where um, more city projects are planned, like Union Reservoir, and um, uh, I'm trying to think of the other, oh, um, the, the Eastern extension of St. Vrain Creek Trail to the state park. So we wanna look at those areas and get some good baseline data on those. Um, and then finally, um, this year with my colleague, um, Danielle Cassidy and uh, Levine and uh, David, we worked on a group of educational signs that are at Macintosh, they're going to get placed here within the next week or so on the importance of prairie habitats and prairie dogs to raptors and those will be mostly established up on the north side and um, so let me summarize by saying um, our challenges 
have been staffing levels this year, um, some unforeseen circumstances. And right now the open space staff is operating at about 50%. So that makes it hard because our, our mandate as stewards of uh, our state mandate as stewards of land is weed control and we're doing a great job of that. Um, but it's also made it difficult for for us to implement all the wildlife projects this year. I had a, a whole agenda of those things and I've pushed back on them because I wanted to make sure that the things that we did have established are were still in effect. Um, and then just the other, uh, the huge thing is just managing people um, on public lands in this time of a pandemic. Um, it, it's difficult for us um, to, to uh, uh, manage that amount of people. But let me just summarize that uh, wildlife is very resilient. Um, we have now the buoys in place at McIntosh Reservoir so that the birds can come back to their roosts there. Um, none of the species that um, might have been impacted by the amount of boating activity at McIntosh, for example, are um, species that are endangered. Um, and so um, I guess that's, uh, that's kind of just a quick summary of the things that I've been working on and what I've noticed and what I can report to you. David? Yes. So thank you, Scott. And again, I just really wanted Scott to lead this off for the, the fact that I think that as you kind of hear my quick presentation here, um, wanting you to be assured and publicly assured that we have great staff on who is dedicated to watching, monitoring, and improving habitat and long line. One of the things I always go back to in this position is the fact that we have done such a great job since the established long line and the Chicago colony, even with our early parks that, you know, we have more than, we have 40, 42 parks this time. We have over our, a dozen open space properties. We have a hundred miles of trail. And I think during this time period, we saw how important those areas were to our, our, our community. Uh, for people to get out. And when they, the governor did his first stay at home order, um, he left that door open for um, people to get out. And he obviously encouraged people to go out and enjoy the great outdoors in Colorado. And people really took that to heart. And I think that's what we're really seeing. I think what really has been the push on council as we've kind of worked with those calls that we've seen as people got out, we saw people that um, maybe had never even thought about paddle boarding. And now they've picked up a inflatable paddle board and they're showing up at Macintosh. So we have um, that increased use of which would typically have um, the typical things you would see in our parks is dogs off leash and increased trash. But as we were, as we were dealing with that, we we're also dealing with how do we keep our staff safe? How do we keep the public safe? And we're dealing with some of those masking issues as, as well and how we implement those, those policies in our parks. So when we should have said, let's just shift resources over to help deal with this increased use, um, we were being pulled in the direction of trying to do some of the pandemic pieces. And as we move forward with that, if, as you remember how we kind of gradually moved through this, um, it really was, let's now open up um, tennis, pickleball, then it was skate parks and basketball and volleyball. And all those took resources that would have been out looking at how we help educate the public in our parks to make sure they're, they're following what I think are really good rules and regs to help us maintain what we have. So as we talk about those parks, those open space and those trails and the wildlife that Scott mentioned, um, the city has also done a great job of working with the public, with PRAB and their groups to come up with management plans and rules and regulations that um, really help protect those. The challenge is how do you um, educate that number of people coming to parks at a new time when they may not have that background and that history with our parks. So again, we, we felt the, the being spread thin and not being able to have that engagement in a time when um, public engagement was a challenge too. You need to be out talking to public, you need to be out signing with public, but we're putting signs up on how to um, social distance in a, in, a, in a skate park. So it was a it was definitely a different challenge that we had. And as we saw that increased use, we saw the um, request from the public to make sure we're out dealing with the dogs off leash, the um, increased use in our, in our natural areas. We also had issues such as people deciding it's time to jump off bridges, people deciding it was time to vandalize restrooms increases in graffiti. So again, that spread got pulled even, even further as we were trying to manage these areas. But the thing I'd like you to know is that as Scott, under Dan Wolford's direction, um, they were continually monitoring that wildlife um, population out there. 
and giving me information. So when we got those trigger points, we felt that it was now time um, to engage staff to wear masks and do, do projects and put them in closer proximity, we could do that. So as Scott had mentioned, we, we got to that point where I got an update from Scott that we needed to put the buoys out at Macintosh because of the impact he was seeing there. We went ahead um, and did that as well. While we're out there doing these things and getting spread thin, I just really want to um, also say that I think we got creative in the fact that um, I just want to give, I can't get enough credit to Jeff Friesner or Jeff Satter um, on how they stepped up to help us out because recreation staff at that point that was not being utilized in the rec centers was out at McIntosh Lake talking to people. They were out at Union Reservoir talking to people about social distancing our rules and regs. So we had a great repurposing of people. Jeff Satter and Mike Butler um, had extra duty officers up at um, Button Rock Reservoir for us to help with the increased demand up there. And that, that increased demand was something that everyone in the county was seeing. I was working in Boulder County. Um, they allowed us to put no parking signs up on some of our roads. The communications group worked with PD to help get a communications trailer up there so we have better um, communication. So this was this was a huge community effort to try to deal with this increased use that um, I think as natural resource managers, we're always trying to figure out how to get more people out, how to engage in, in these areas. But I think we always thought it would happen not just one weekend where we had this kind of an increase, but over time where we could develop programs to address that. Um, so we really have been doing a lot of of catch up. Um, but I think these these practices and stuff in place and the public being educated and Marika and her crew really helping us out with getting information out has done a great job because I spent the 4th of July up at Button Rock, which uh, when I first went up there the first couple of weekends after the pandemic and the, the stay at home orders, there was no way an emergency vehicle could have gotten down County Road 80. People are parked on both sides. Um, this weekend, people really, I think, started getting the message to look for other places. The Town of Lions actually let us use their message board in town to let people know Button Rock parking lot was full. So this weekend, it really felt like a, a busy weekend, but it was very manageable. So we're starting to see that dilution. I think part of the fact that we have opened up rec centers and pools and swim beaches, um, you can get a reservation out at Rocky Mountain National Park. Coming up soon, you can walk down Main Street in our new public spaces area. So I think people are having some more opportunities to do um, other things besides just to go to our parks. Um, however, the piece I'd, I'd really like to share is that I, I think myself and other land managers feel like this really is the new normal. That family that bought the four paddle boards and they know about Macintosh now, they're gonna be going back to Macintosh. That person that showed a button rock to hike in flip flops and now has hiking boots, they're going back to button rock. So I, I do think that we as an organization just need to recognize that um, we do need to provide the information, the education, the outreach to help people make good decisions, uh, but also that enforcement component when people decide they don't want to do that, we can make sure we can hold people accountable too. So that's pretty easy piece for me to sit in front of council and Harold and say, that's really easy. We just had more resources. And I think Scott mentioned them being short in, in the open space program. That's some, that's some health issues. Um, and again, some of the, the seasonal higher increases and stuff, but those are things that everyone's dealing with. But the piece I would really, pass on is I, I do think this is a very creative group. Um, I think our community is amazing. They have stepped up in the past and they're again, just like after the flood, kind of chomping at a bit to see what they can do to get out and help them volunteer. So um, if you've been by the Rose Garden, that Rose Garden would not look the way it does today if it wasn't for our volunteers out there. Um, them doing things like volunteer ranger programs, education, outreach, engaging with the community that way, working with Marika and stuff. I, I think there's ways that we can address this increased use, um, being creative, but it, it does take resources and how we achieve that is, is gonna take some work. And Harold and I talked is, you know, scaling back in some areas to, to hit those areas that need work. And at one point it really was that learning curve of how you address keeping staff safe and the public safe. Now we've kind of moved back from that. We say, we've, we've got that under control. Let's sift back to looking at how our natural areas are doing. And I, I think Dan and Scott and um, his group are doing a great job continuing that monitoring so that we can um, do what I think my job really is to make sure that we provide access to our community, knowing how important these areas are, but that we pass it on in a way that um, the next generation has it in as good or better shape than they, they have in the past. And I, I think we really do have the right people here right now to do that. I think um, we all, like every city employee right now feel like we don't have enough time to do everything we want to do as well as we want to do it. But I, I think the staff has done a great job. Um, I think the community has done a great job helping us reach out to um, deal with some of these, these issues. And again, I, I think the 
collaboration between different work groups has just been invaluable in how we were able to address this and come through this. And as Scott said, do we have social trails? Yes. Do we have people in areas they probably shouldn't have been according to management plan? Absolutely. Um, can we recover at this point? I think we can. I, I know we can. And it, it's, it's going to take work. And I think like we heard Scott say, everyone in these groups are, are willing to put their shoulder to the grindstone and, and, and make this happen. All right, Harold, uh, Councilmember Peck. So thank you, um, Mayor Bagley. David, I don't know if you wanted comments now or not. That's you absolutely, you're absolutely fine. Yep, that's what I'd. Okay. So um, I understand uh, what you're saying, and, that, and I agree. We have an incredible staff, and we don't have enough resources. Um, but we are still getting a lot of emails and complaints from residents about these areas that they are not being uh, managed. So my question is, how many park rangers do we actually have? So, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, our park rangers right now, um, we, we currently have up at um, Button Rock, we would have one FTE, but Jamie Friel has um, left the city and that, those positions are um, being advertised up right now for Jamie's watershed manager position. So that was one position. Harold has worked with me and we've really said that one of the reasons I think everyone knows that um, there's just a lot of work up there. As you see, running that watershed, the city's primary water source is a huge job working with other agencies to deal with four or three plans that we were able to convert some of the temporary do dollars to over to making a second FTE. So that's why it's taking a little longer because we will be advertising or we are advertising for a senior watershed ranger who will do a lot more of the planning and, and those sort of uh, projects out in the park as well. And then having a watershed ranger for Button Rock. So that'd be two positions there. They're not filled right now, but we, we are closing that on the 10th. At Union Reservoir, um, John Brim is our, our lead ranger out there, our senior ranger. And then he has two FTEs working out there. So we really at this point um, have John Brim and his two rangers that really are our three FTEs that are really covering everything. We were very fortunate in the fact that when Jamie left, he had a seasonal and he had trained for a year. And Miles has, Miles Churchill has done a great job of a button rock, um, but it's really short. So long-term right now, if I had everything filled, I'd have two at, two up at um, button rock and I'd have three at Union as far as FTEs. And, and just so you know, that's why, um, it's been such a great help having REC and PD because if you think about how busy those two areas get in summertime, they really do get locked into Union and Button Rock. So everything in between becomes a challenge to cover during the summer months. And right now it's it's really um, hard. If you think about, the, if you've been by Dickens or if you've been by McIntosh on the weekends, um, we could not do it without the help of getting right now from, from PD and from our creation. So, um... We don't know how long this uh, COVID or if we're going to have a surge or, or what it is. So my question is, actually, it's a, a suggestion. Have you, has the city staff thought about having citizens patrols to get out information about what our parks are and what the use is supposed to be and um, just having contacts because Basically, we're saying we have three FTEs for how many parks and trails we yeah. have? Yes, um, we have parks and dozen, two dozen open spaces and 100 miles of trail. That's not enough people if for, for the use that we're getting. And, that, and that's basically why I wanted to have a discussion about what, what can we do at some point. I know that we're, what about the uh, rangers for the downtown area? Is that uh, feasible to use any of them, even though I understand they're being paid by LDDA. It's a different. Uh... So only 15% of their time is being paid by LDDA. So they okay. would, and this is this is one of the challenges too. When Harold said, you know, what, why are we short on some of these staffing pieces? Some were um, really because of health issues. And when, when we didn't know our budget, we really tried scaling back in areas we weren't sure about what we needed. So we did not fill those positions yet. So those are still sitting out there. LDDA um, has their dollars. We have our dollars, but again, we. We just are trying to be very cautious in how we spend those dollars this year. Um, I just like to go back and just touch on how this this pandemic really has shifted things because, again, Harold is aware of the fact and been working with me since 
um, I've got here, he knows my commitment to volunteer programs. And, you know, Danielle Levine's job, who is doing project management half time and volunteer coordinator half time, we were looking to split those into a program that allowed for a full time volunteer coordinator. And one of those top projects really was doing a community ranger and an, a community interpretive program. And their models are out there, Jefferson County, Boulder County, where people are out on the trail in some sort of identifying t shirt where they can just talk to the public at that more of that interpretive level. And then ones that have that enforcement piece. And they, they're they easy to say we can do, but again, when they put that shirt on, they're representing the city. So it really takes um, training. It takes a lot of work to make sure you get good people on the program. Um, we have a great program with our handicap parking program and um, we've worked with them on how we could set something up similar in our park. So those were kind of on track. And I think as Scott mentioned, some of the programs he had on track, they. They got a little derailed this year, but I think we're really trying to find that balance between right now how we're managing the public and how we're protecting those natural resources. So I think it's a great idea and it's something that we we definitely have been thinking on about. So is there any way we can uh, up that timeline to get people in our parks, if nothing else, to hand out literature, to educate them, to remind them that it's uh, not, it's they're not to swim in some of these places, they're not to, and then if it doesn't work, inform the police department or whatever that this group is not adhering to the rules. Councilmember Peck, I would, I would be cautious about that. And here's the reason. I don't have any, I don't know if anyone else is on from law enforcement or Jeff Raywin's on right now. I think what I've seen in the community right now is people are being told what to do all the time, every day, from staying in your house and who you can communicate with and wearing a mask. And the simple request to put your life vest on, the simple request to put your dog on a leash are, is being met with um, huge disdain. It, it, the voluntary compliance that I always said I could have gotten you know, a year ago, just is not there. People, when I was putting the buoys out at McIntosh, it was, I really got to see again what my um, staff is going through as they're trying to educate people. People, the response is, you cannot tell me what to do. Um, leave me alone, go away. So it takes, for me, I, I'm used to that as my background, but for a, a resident to do that, that's a very tough spot to be in. And I, I don't want to set those individuals up for failure. I need, think we need to set them up for success. It, and that does take time. And I, I wish I had a, a fast fix for you. Um, but I, again, I, we think about this and discuss it pretty much every Monday. David, why do you think there is the disdain? And is it, uh, is it more disdain now during this uh, specific time that we're in? Uh, that's a, exactly I, I'm it. trying to wrap my head around it as well. I, I, I definitely think it is. I, I think I say that people are really saying, there's a couple of things that I, I'm gonna give you my, um, my personal view. I think if they're being told what to do, where to go, how to act, how to, how to distance, where to stand, what dot to stand on at the grocery store, to put a mask on or not to put a mask on, to go to this friend's house, but not this friend's house. I think that overload of being told what to do is, is overwhelming. And I also think there's a piece in there with all of this going on in our, our world right now, is my dog off release really a problem? That's what I'm hearing in voices. Don't you really have something better to do than tell us that we can't stay cool in a public place? And, you know, a year ago, it would have been a different conversation. I think we could engage them and help explain why we have those rules and regs, why that water isn't tested at Macintosh, how that's a health concern for them. And um, parents help that conversation too. And what we see now is when you talk to a younger person, the parents jump right in to defend their kids on this and say, it's a hot day out and they need to be cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hop in here. Um, uh, the, uh, we could, we could uh, this format's challenging enough as is. And so I'm going to, I'm going to, call timeout on this particular conversation. Um, we could be here all night talking about thoughts, feelings, et cetera. I'm gonna call on you, Council Member Dago Faring, but what we need to do is I will unmute you and I will call on people, but we're just bouncing in and talking. And so I don't wanna be here till 11 o'clock. We're gonna follow the agenda and, and we'll go from there. Council Member Susie Dago Faring, you're up. Can I get control over the, the mutes, please, Susan? I'm not, not you, Susan, Susie, Susan Wolak. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Council Member Dago Farron, you're up. Yeah, I don't, I don't hear her. So um, in the meantime, 
can we put up signage, how, something that we can have immediately? So more signage around no swimming in these areas. I mean, Lake McIntosh, I've taken my dog over there for years. We don't go in the water, but all, it, I mean, it's gross. I, I don't understand, but anyways, that's, that's something totally different. But to have designated areas um, around parking, um, our, one thing I've noticed is that too many cars are parked far, uh, far away from the curb. So when they're parked on both sides, it's really narrow to get through. So maybe, so people are more cognizant if they have the signage in more visible places. Is that something we can address immediately? Harold, what do you think That's, about that idea? Yeah, I think we can, we can get signage out there quickly on those issues and, and work to, to inform people. Um, I would just be upfront uh, up to what David said. Um, they may or may not, go for the signage. Um, we literally gated um, the bridge and they were climbing around the gate um, and climbing on the structure. So I think we can get signage out there and we can definitely, um, I'm gonna include Rob in terms of the parking and the distance. That's right, easy Council. for us to do. All right, great. Council Member Waters, you are, can, and Susan again, can I get power to unmute? Because we spend a lot of time Thank you. I'm unmuted, I think. Yeah. No, I just want to, Susan, if you're here, I just, if I can unmute as we Mayor, go, it would save us lots of time. Mayor, I can't do that, unfortunately. I can only give you the co-host rights that you have. Um, I can ask them to unmute, but really, if they held down the space bar that, that no, should... Not, but, no, I, I'm not talking about, I, I, I want the power, just like it, uh, council, I want to be able to run this meeting in a, I don't want to be here till 11 o'clock tonight, just having a chit chat session. I want to call on people. We're either going to have motions or we're going to be. I, I can't about unmute the them either, Mayor. As, okay. as All right. And we'll just keep doing it as is the best we can. All right. Council Member Waters. Um, in the interest of, of not getting into a kind of free ranging, free ranging conversation, I will only make this comment. And then I do have a couple of questions. Uh, I, I think the question about enforcement. And, and what does enforcement mean and how much of the solutions to what's happening with our parks, the risk, you know, the, the, the outcry regarding fireworks and, and somebody, even what we heard earlier tonight in terms of traffic, uh, I, I think we need to take a step back and have a conversation as a, as a leadership group and with the community or those who are willing to engage about which of the, which of the challenges or, or problems we're dealing with right now are gonna be solved by somebody enforcing as opposed to us as a community accepting responsibility. And with that thought, I wanted, David, I would like just on the, on the number of rangers, you mentioned, I didn't know Jamie left. You've got two up at Button Rock. You've got three out at, at, the, the, uh, at Union. Uh, compare that to what numbers you had a year ago. How many rangers did you have at this time a year ago? At this time last year, we really- uh, your, All your seasonal help. So we would have had, one less, Button Rock would have still had the two because one would have been a temporary versus uh, a full time is all. Um, we would have had the three at Union and then they have seasonals out at Union. I think they probably have five and we are, again, we've had recreation helping us out over there. And then we would have had the com two community rangers who again, were spending about 15% of their time in the downtown area where Kimberly was paying for them. And the rest of the time they were out on the Greenway and in those parks. So they're, they're the ones that really could have been at the Macintosh, they could have been at, at Dickens as far as where the funds came run, from, from the open space and the general fund to, or the conservation trust dollars to pay for their time in those parks. And, ja and Jamie had a whole cadre of, of youth volunteers up at Button Rock. Yes, right? he, had the, he had the youth corps yeah. as well. I guess, so, but, so I just wanna get clear in my head, we are operating with an approximation right now of the capacity for enforcement that we had a year ago. Very close, yes. All right, number one. Number two, uh, you sent us an email earlier today uh, with some very disappointing information about vandalism. Uh, we, are, are you gonna touch on that at all in, this, in your presentation? I think as I kind of went through that, it's just that I hit on in the fact that as, as staff is really out there trying to make sure, again, our, our goal always is to be able to talk to the public, engage, education, voluntary compliance. And if they're out working on things as far as vandalism, it's just pulling those resources in, in different areas where we're not having the chance to really deal with the, the issues of protecting our natural resources. 
Well, when we no, start, but before we start getting email messages from the community about about restrooms being closed at Sandstone Ranch, at you know, at, at what were the other two at Kanemoto Park, in a left hand park, it might be willing to have some public disclosure of the number one, the damage that was done, the cost of of uh, to date of vandalism in our parks this year. I think the public ought to know. You're short handed, and we have we have folks for mindless reasons, I think, doing serious vandalism to, part, to restrooms that are gonna be closed, I don't know why. And what it's costing them, what it's costing the city in terms of real dollars and the public in terms of opportunity. The, the piece I'd, I'd answer back to that is again, I think working with the, the public safety and outreach and then putting this on social media, I think we're, we're again, trying to engage the community to help solve these problems too. I, I, I hear Mike Butler a lot of time too, that we can't fix ourselves, we have to count the community too. So between the Rangers, these partnerships with PD, um, I, I agree with you that the community needs to know this. They need to be aware of this. And I think as we can let them know these are happening in areas that are close to them, that they can help be those eyes and ears out there for us too. Well, the number you gave us earlier today was over $57,000 in costs for vandalism as of today. That did not include those three restrooms. That was before those three restrooms. Yes. A year ago, the number was for a year was 44,000. Yeah. And the year before that was an approximation of 44,000. The public got to know, right? It's it, in a time where we're stretched financially and we're stretched in terms of our capacity with people. Um, but there's a, there's something else going on here that, that uh, is going to have an impact on the public. And they're going to turn to you and to us for answers and a solution. Uh, and it's going to be more enforcement here or more enforcement there with less capacity and, and having directed funds to try to mitigate what is uh, an, uh, behavior that's hard to understand in terms of damaging amenities that, are, that we've created for the public. I just think we ought to have more explicit conversations about, about what's going on and, and, and invite the public into the solution. That's part of what Council Member Peck was suggesting. And I get the, I get the, the, the security concerns and not putting volunteers in a position to, to experience what some of your staff has experienced. And my understanding, we've had our, your staff, have people have, have, have been spit on. Is that, is that accurate? I have not heard that. Okay, well, then maybe that was a rumor. I'm glad to know that that's not, that's, that's not accurate if it's not. But they're subjected to a response that, that, that's unprecedented in terms of the reaction of the public. And I think we need to all just take a step back and say, look, this is not who we want to be as a community. We have to figure out how we're going to move forward with whatever the constraints are in ways that are, are, are where there's more sanity and there's more compassion and there's more patience, and there's more acceptance. And if we don't talk about it, given trend lines, hard to see how it's going to happen. I'll stop. All right, great. So again, so let's, uh, Harold, is there anything else that you'd like to share at this point as a staff to city council? No, I just think that, I think the challenge is to, to the point that, that's been made. We had three restrooms, um, severely damaged. Um, we're, we're chasing folks all over. Um, and so when you, when you look at that in terms of um, questions about all of the enforcement piece. We are um, moving around this community. We were using code enforcement to help. Code enforcement's now getting overwhelmed with calls because of just the volume of people that are at home. And so many of these mechanisms are being overtaxed. Um, as we get clarity on the budget, what I can say is it may allow us to pull um, the triggers on some of these positions that um, we're funded out of some of these other funds. And so we're gonna be having, you know, that conversation. So there may be the ability to bring a couple more, but I don't wanna give anyone the impression that's gonna fix anything. Um, because the reality is we are, are chasing many, many bad, bad behaviors um, in many locations. And unfortunately, it's not just us. As I talk to my colleagues, it is virtually every city on the front range that's being challenged with these types of issues. Um, and if one closes something, we see it move to the another, another city. So we're actually talking collectively how we deal with these issues. So I just, there's, there's not a panacea to this one. And um, the 
only solution is, I think, for people to um, really approach it and respect it. But I want to be cautious on the volunteer idea and how you approach people. Right, Even well, we we're can... getting chastised, so be careful. All right, so we're going to go ahead and conclude this section of the meeting. Um, we can, if anybody else has any other questions, I'd encourage you to contact staff directly offline. Council Member Beck, we'll go with you. Go ahead. Uh, I am going to push back on your comment earlier. This meeting, when we passed the motion last week, my motion was to have a special uh, session to have this conversation so council could talk about it, but it was amended by Councilman Councilwoman Martin to have a study session. So what council is doing? I think what? you're getting it wrong, Councilmember Peck. I made the original motion and you uh, substituted your motion. I... Well, whatever, but uh, I uh, to say that you don't want a discussion, Mayor Bagley, that goes against our motion. No, no, that, all, that I'm was just, the whole point. No, 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 all, no, I don't, I don't, I don't really don't. care if we're here till midnight to no, no. make sure that the residents hear what we are, what we are getting and where we and the and the the feedback from staff and what our concerns are and, so. I, and i and i get that councilor pick i'm just following the agenda i have no problem if it's on the agenda we can discuss things all day long but i'm just trying to my job is mayor and this particular is the chair of meeting and i'm just trying to keep us on task that's it and right now we are on the COVID 19 update by the city manager that that is what is on the agenda, and so I, I'm not. I don't disagree with anything you said about putting this on a on a on an agenda study session to discuss what we voted on. I'm just trying to get us through the agenda, and in this particular case, this format's difficult only because to follow Robert's rules of order, um, we're, we are we are all beginning to have conversations with indi individual staff members, and if all seven of us did that, making three, four, five comments, asking questions. We are going to be here all night. And there's a difference between doing the people's business, which I'm all for doing, and each of us just sharing our opinion. So as, as I'm just trying to get us through the through the meeting. So let's move on to Longmont Housing Authority update by city manager. Harold, do you wanna give us that please? We don't have an update on that. Okay, great. Then let's go on to our study session items. Number uh, A, partners in energy and memorandum of understanding. Susan, do you want to go ahead and put the slide deck up? On it right now. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bagley and council members. I'm Susan Bartlett. I'm a key account manager with Longmont Power and Communications. And uh, tonight I want to update you on our partners in energy work with Excel Energy. We introduced this to you last fall. Uh, Excel Energy provides natural gas to much of the Longmont community. Partners in Energy is an avenue for working together with another utility to reduce energy use in buildings in Longmont. So I understand that many in the community are keen to move away from natural gas. And our aim with this effort is just to make existing buildings as energy efficient as possible on all fronts right now as we make plans for the future. Next slide, please. So as a backdrop, I'll just say that the climate challenge and working toward the city's goal of 100% renewable electric energy by 2030 is going to take a uh, concerted effort on all of these integrated initiatives. And the Partners in Energy work aligns specifically with the built environment efforts and then it focuses on commercial building energy efficiency, as well as energy efficiency in low-income low homes in our community. And incidentally, it also supports the sustainability plan targets and recommendations from the Climate Action Task Force that you heard about last week from Lisa Knobloch and that you'll hear a little bit more about yet this evening. So um, things did look considerably different in the fall when we presented to this to you, but um, our aim is to be nimble and flexible and to make progress where we can. Next slide, please. So here's where we are in the process. Um, 
which includes a pause from the end of March until now, just given the COVID-19 implications and other priorities that council has had to deal with. So we introduced the collaboration in October last year. And from October to March, we developed a work plan with Excel Energy. And we intended to present that work plan and the outcomes to the Sustainability Advisory Board and Council in March. But just given the cancellations and all the other priorities, we're just now getting back on track with this. So we'd like to get the green light to start working with Excel Energy on the activities that we identified in the plan and um, you know, especially on some commercial energy benchmarking for other efforts. Um, the work plan efforts will take us through November of 2021, and that will give us some time to evaluate our progress at the end of 2021 and report back to the Sustainability Advisory Board and to Council at the end of the year. Next slide, please. So just as a recap, because October was a lifetime ago, um, Partners in Energy, it's, it's an opportunity for us to have greater access to community-wide natural gas data and also to some other Excel Energy resources to help us uh, and to support energy efficiency in buildings. So Walmart is uh, one community that's part of a growing cadre of Northern Colorado communities that are participating in Partners in Energy. Some of these other communities include Fort Collins, Lafayette, Erie, Superior, Louisville, so quite a number in Boulder County, um, Brookfield, Pueblo, Greeley, Westminster, North Glen, all of whom are looking to make progress on their own climate and sustainability goals. And so this is a really st a strong network for us to be a part of so that we can share best practices and innovations and also um, share methods for uh, increasing awareness around this important um, opportunity to reduce energy in buildings. And so the first phase of Partners in Energy, which started in October, included Excel Energy sharing some aggregated natural gas data for Longmont. And you can see this chart here. It's just a single representation of some of the data that we received, but it shows our community-wide natural gas data broken out by commercial and residential customers over the past four years. It also, this phase included a facilitated planning process so that we could develop a work plan specific to Longmont priorities. And uh, we completed that plan in March. And, and so here we are today in July, we're ready to implement the work plan. And uh, we've got some built-in flexibility, especially given that we finished it up in March and so much has changed since then. But there, like I said, there is some built-in flexibility uh, given the continued implications of COVID and the work plan is built on three strategies that are already underway at the city. So definitely something specific to what, what we would like to do in the city. And these three strategies align really well with the Climate Action Task Force recommendations. And um, in the work plan, we've identified specific ways to collaborate with Excel Energy so that we really can have greater impact than we would have if we were working alone. And we'll do that through continued data sharing and also um, taking advantage of some benchmarking expertise, leveraging co-branding and marketing resources, as well as outreach channels and that sort of thing. These are just a couple of examples of some co-branded materials that Partners in Energy has helped other communities develop. The one on the left is one they developed with the City of Fort Collins to encourage residential energy and water audits. And then on the one on the right is one they did with Broomfield to engage businesses in energy efficiency. And these are good examples, I think, because they um, come from communities where there are multiple utilities and a shared customer base and kind of that shared objective of conservation and efficiency. Next slide. So as I mentioned, there are three strategies that are detailed in the work plan. The first one is commercial building benchmarking. Um, LBC has been working on a benchmarking demonstration project this year. In fact, my colleague Debbie Seidman presented to you in May about the benchmarking demonstration. Uh, the goal here is to inform a broader program in the coming years, and we want to identify benefits for businesses as well as those for our community in terms of having this kind of program. And our work plan maps out how we can take advantage of Excel Energy's experience working with other communities like Denver and Fort Collins 
they have their own benchmarking programs and we want to use uh, some of that experience as well as um, the needs that we've identified ourselves to inform our own development, make our program as navigable and successful as possible for participants. So the collaboration that we built into the work plan will allow us to draw on Excel Energy's engagement and outreach know-how. It's also gonna give us access to some benchmarking staff that understand Portfolio Manager, and that's the free benchmarking platform that we're gonna use. And it will uh, give us access to that staff to help our participants access and upload their natural gas data to the, to the platform. And then finally, it's going to allow us to mobilize some Excel Energy benchmarking training expertise. So things go as smoothly as possible for our uh, commercial building owners. You know, there's going to be a learning curve. There is with anything new and uh, we just like to make that as smooth as possible. And as Debbie mentioned back in May, the targets that we have in the work plan and for 2020 are to benchmark nine of our municipal buildings, as well as 10 plus other key commercial buildings. And that will help us kind of test out our approach. Um, ultimately, we want to have all commercial buildings in Long Pine that are greater than 20,000 square feet be benchmarking over the next few years with an overall goal of, of increased energy awareness and improved commercial building efficiency. Next slide, please. So our second strategy um, is a program that helps income qualified residents with high energy burdens, uh, helps them improve the efficiency and comfort of their homes, helps them lower their utility bills and uh, just create healthier living environments. And this particular strategy makes me think what, about what Harold was talking about earlier in trying to provide some assistance for um, uh, utility bills that are in arrears. We would love to have customers receiving those services. We would also like to help customers um, kind of lower their bills over the long term. So it's more of a manageable expense for them. And in 2019, the city supported 32 homes with program services. Um, we want to increase this level of support to more than 80 households over the next 16 months. Um, we'll, we'll probably need some additional funding. We hope to get from Boulder County and some other sources, but um, we think there's a lot of need and we would definitely like to step up our game here. Uh, we're also realists and we're taking into consideration the complications of COVID-19. Um, right now, people don't want other people in their homes. Uh, at the same time, there are so many who are just having a hard time making ends meet. So if we can provide some services to help reduce those utility costs and improve efficiency for some, we really want to do it. And if we can't do it right now, we want to plan for what's beyond COVID-19 so that we're ready to mobilize when that time comes. And the way that we're going to work with Excel in this is just to better publicize the programs that we, the program that we have available. Um, we want anybody that's eligible to know about this and benefit from the services, and we can do that through co-branded outreach materials. Um, also, being able to leverage some of Excel Energy's outreach channels so that we're getting the information out um, to as many customers or participants as possible. So this third strategy builds on the inaugural success of sustainable business program. Uh, it started last year and it's a response to the city's sustainability plan that highlights actions to promote environmental stewardship, social equity, and economic vitality in the community. It also supports your climate emergency resolution that challenges businesses to take action to combat climate change. In 2019, there were 21 businesses that were certified in one of these three levels. And um, our work plan targets are to inform and engage an additional 80 businesses beyond these 21 that are already participants. And of those 80, we'd like to certify 50 of those businesses at one of these levels. And we're also focusing on supporting minority owned and frontline businesses. And um, this is an effort that aligns well with Climate Action Task Force and the Just Transition Plan objectives. Um, you'll hear, hear a little bit more about those later this evening. So the areas we wanna collaborate here will include supporting um, quantifying results of, bis of business activities. So you know, what are the impacts when businesses take on additional projects or activities 
that allow them to become certified or developing sector specific education and outreach if we want to address restaurants because they've been particularly hard hit during the pandemic. What are some things we can put together for them that are specific to their operations to help them uh, reduce energy and water use in their business? We're gonna to continue to leverage rebates. We're gonna develop some content for case studies so we can encourage more, more businesses to participate. Next slide, please. So you'll note in your council packet that we have a letter of recommendation from the Sustainability Advisory Board to move forward with this next phase of Partners in Energy and to get going on the activities in the work plan. So what, what I'm asking for this evening is for our council to show support for our strategies, to give us some direction and give us the direction for LPC to sign a non-binding memorandum of understanding with Excel Energy to proceed with the strategies that we identified in the work plan. Um, the, the memorandum of understanding outlines collaboration through November of 2021 so that we can accomplish some of the things that we've identified. Um, there really are no additional cost impacts to the city as city staff and partners in energy staff are already in place to support these strategies. And then at the end of 2021, we'd like to come back to council, share our progress, um, talk about um, where we are, what we have left to do and uh, what, what we might want to take on next to expand these strategies. And that's all I had tonight. All right, great. Can we get the screen back and then we'll pick out questions from council members. We'll start with council member Christensen. Then we'll go with council member Martin. Um, I would move that we um, move this memorandum of understanding forward. We discussed um, uh, this at the sustainability advisory board. And while <clears throat> there are problems with um, Excel Energy and all that. This is, they are um, a good partner in getting us the data we need so that we know what we're doing. And that's the point of this is to get a, a, a wide array of data so that we can understand what our energy needs are. So I would move that we uh, accept this, uh, the memorandum of understanding, non-binding memorandum of, of understanding with Excel. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Um, uh, other than, other than, uh, other than, I, I see a councilman Martin, I guess, uh, Harold, I guess my only question is, is this coming back for a vote or is this, is this is just a resolution? No, no, I, I want to, is, is it coming back for a resolution? Do you need input now? Yes, this will come back for a resolution for you all to vote on okay. if you okay. want us to do that. Um, okay, so Council Member Pat, can we go ahead and wait to vote on that? I'm sorry, Council Member Christensen, can we wait to vote on that? Do you want to unmute? Yes, sorry, I have four ways to unmute myself. Um, yes, that's fine. All right. All right, we'll go ahead and put that on the next regular session meeting then. All right, Council Member Martin. Can you help her out, Susan? All right, there we sometimes go. Sometimes my space bar unmutes me and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, uh, I heard in the report that some data has been shared already. Who has that data and is it available to the public and is it available to the council? Um, this is Susan Bartlett again and Longmont Power and Communications has that data, it is in the work plan and it is public data that's shareable. So we can share that with council. So how does the council get the data like tomorrow? Um, I can just, I can send you what's in the work plan. And um, I, I guess I would ask what type of data, what types of data you're interested in. All of it. Everything that came from Excel, um, we want to understand the energy usage 
by household and by business. The businesses we understand have to be depersonalized, but, um, and I don't actually care about having anything personalized, but um, I'd like to be able to tell one household from another. Harold, so, hold, on a second, hold on a second, Susan. So Harold, is it possible to get Councilmember Martin that information? Yeah, we can get that information to the council. We'll have to scrub it to make sure that there's no personal information that's in there. But if it's open record, we it's open record. All right. So can when when more or less when when could we expect that information? Susan? I can I can send it tomorrow. Perfect. The data that we get from Excel Energy is not linked to customers. It's aggregated to comply with privacy, customer privacy rules. And I'm in favor of that, so I'm, that's, that's fine. When you have an aggregated number, does it say how many households that represents? So essentially the data that we have is number of residential customers, number of commercial industrial customers, and then we have total use in each one of those sectors, and then we have a grand total. Yes. Okay, so, that's not very much data, but I'll take it. So, Councilmember, so we'll, so Councilmember Martin, what, what, we'll get the information to Council, and then if you could look through it, and then let me know if it needs to go on a future agenda, we'll just do that. Is that okay? Okay. All right, Mayor great. Bagley, if I may. Yeah. Um, uh, Harold, I was of the belief that this just required council support and did not require returning for a resolution, which is similar to the phase one that we went through with pies. So is, can we confirm that? So if, if the issue is that it doesn't require, if it just needs your support, then we need it. But if it requires an action of the council, then we need to bring it back at a regular agenda. I'm not sure what the, if the MOE is an IGA with other groups, then we need to bring it back on the, for an action. I'm given, if it's an MOU, it's gonna be coming back. I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, who's the agreement? So, so the, the agreement, it's a non-binding memorandum of understanding with Excel Energy uh, for phase one, Dave, it, it came to council, you all um, agreed to support the effort, Dave Hornbacher signed that and then we proceeded. So all my right, understanding then. was there was a similar process this time around. So if David can sign it, we just need direction from council to, to move forward. All right, well, Thank you for got, that clarity. Well, then let's go ahead and vote on it now then. We've got a motion on the table from Councilmember Christensen, which I seconded. So we're all in favor of, of supporting the Partners in Energy and Memorandum of Understanding and directing staff to move forward, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. <laughs> all right, the motion passes unanimously. And if it does need to come back, According to you, Jane, just bring it back. We'll vote on it again. Good stuff. All right. Harold, let's move on to the presentation of the recommendations of the Climate Action Task Force on Education and out Outreach, adapt uh, ad Adaptation and Resilience, and Land Use, please. Lisa? Yeah. Hey, Mayor Bagley, members of council, I'm Lisa Malbach, the Sustainability Program Manager, and I'm here again for the second round of uh, review of Climate Action Task Force recommendations, as well as the equ equity recommendations developed by the Just Transition Plan Committee. Um, Susan, can you go ahead and put my presentation here? There we go. And you can go ahead and move it to the next slide. Great. So just a, a quick reminder, I know it was late last week, um, but we reviewed the recommendations in the building energy use, renewable energy and transportation topic areas, as well as a summary of, of community engagement activities and the recommendation regarding governance. And tonight uh, we'll be getting into the topic areas of adaptation and resilience, education and outreach and land use and waste management, as well as talking about equitable climate action and reviewing the equity recommendations developed by the Just Transition Plan Committee. And then we'll discuss how council you all want to move forward uh, now that the report is completed. Uh, similar to last time, uh, I'll be presenting the Climate Action Task Force uh, portion with members of the Climate Action Task Force on hand to answer questions if need be or add anything that I may have missed. 
Uh, and then we'll have Francie Jaffe from Sustainability, as well as two members from the Just Transition Plan Committee, Garrett Chapel and Eric Pieto, that'll be presenting their recommendations. And one thing I just want to note before we get into the presentation is that what we're essentially going to be looking at is two separate sets of recommendations that have combi been combined into uh, one report, and one being the recommendations from the Climate Action Task Force, which you can essentially look at as the the what of um, how long one can go about addressing climate change. And then the Just Transition Plan Committee's equity recommendations, which can be viewed more as the how we would go about implementing climate action recommendations to ensure that the work is being done in an equitable way and that we're engaging the most uh, people most impacted by climate change and really making sure that we're not leaving anyone behind. And I think that'll become more clear as we, as we get into the recommendations, but I just want you to keep that in mind as we go through them and then when we get into the discussion for next steps. Okay, you can move to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna just jump right into the topic area re recommendations. Again, like last time, we have a lot of information to get through. So please feel free to jump in if you have clarifying questions, uh, but otherwise we'd like to hold discussion till the end. Uh, next slide. So the first topic area is adaptation and resilience and this section has three recommendations. Uh, the first was which is focusing on addressing public health in a warming climate. And this is looking at developing a coalition to identify issues and solutions uh, for the impacts of a warming climate on public health, particularly around things like heat waves, severe, severe weather events, air quality issues, and the detection, surveillance, and treatment of um, potential diseases, with a focus specifically on needs of low-income households uh, and those experiencing homelessness. Um, people that are at most risk of those impacts. And the target is to have a plan within a year and a half or so or sooner, depending on the timeline of the COVID pandemic. Uh, the second recommendation focuses on preparing the, rec the city for potential sustained drought conditions and impacts to water availability due to climate change by promoting and incentivizing water conservation measures such as zero escaping and the use of native vegetation. And the goal would be to reduce citywide water usage by 35 to 40% by 2025. And I do want to note that it would require pretty extensive financial resources and likely a significant redesign of our parks and golf courses in order to meet this goal. And further research and analysis would be necessary to understand the full fiscal impacts and identify a feasible path uh, for implementation. And the last recommendation uh, focuses on launching a public education and outreach campaign that targets residents and commercial realtors to help inform them of the dangers of flooding and the value of investing in flood mitigation projects. Next slide, please. So in the education and outreach topic area, our first recommendation is uh, comprehensive workforce development. And this um, program would focus on building upon already existing training opportunities uh, to increase training and incentives in the public and private se sectors to expand and improve Longmont's climate action workforce. And this really cuts across a number of the different recommendations to really uh, get the work that we need to done while building um, jobs and income at the same time. The program has three main goals. Uh, first is offering career ladders, stable employment, and a livable wage, expanding the number of green energy professionals, and building a diverse and inclusive workforce all of which are especially important uh, right now moving into the COVID recovery process. Currently, there's a pretty significant shortage of contractors in this field and a need for technicians, engineers, electricians, and other relevant types of workers. Uh, the next recommendation is to develop and deliver a climate lecture series to raise awareness uh, of and foster discussion regarding the climate emergency. Uh, the first series is actually already set to launch in the spring of 2021, and that was spearheaded by a Climate Action Task Force member, Peter Wood, uh, which he received a grant through the CU Boulder's Center for Humanities and the Arts um, to get that program going. And that's a great opportunity for us to gauge the success of that initiative. The next recommendation uh, is similar, but focused on creating, um, similar and focusing on creating greater community awareness of and engagement in climate issues by developing and publishing a series of articles highlighting historically relevant stories uh, coupled with current climate information. And the article series would have both print and online versions as well as be bilingual. Uh, next slide, please. 
The fourth recommendation focuses on leveraging the existing front range rising exhibit at the Longmont Museum to integrate the use of energy and climate issues um, in our area over time. It's focused on elementary school students, but is very accessible for all ages. And there's a lot of opportunity to include uh, climate information into that. And then the last uh, recommendation is developing a community sustainability liaison program, which would identify and provide resources to trusted members of neighborhoods to serve as liaisons to educate folks in their neighborhoods on sustainability, renewable energy, and other relevant matters to address the climate emergency. And this is a great opportunity to leverage our newly launched neighborhood programs that we've been developing in partnership with community services and help us build a network of liaisons and foster diverse participation in this program. Next slide, please. And the topic area is land use and waste management. The first recommendation is developing and launching a program to promote, incentivize, and educate the public on local food production and address potential barriers in existing code that might hinder that. So current co zoning code allows for urban agriculture, excuse me, urban agriculture in all zones, but doesn't allow for things like roadside farm stands and other things that might help promote the sale of resident grown produce. Uh, this would also be looking at engaging the school district to incentivize students to participate in gardening and food production efforts and helping to establish local food co-ops uh, for sale of resident grown produce as well. The second recommendation is focusing on uh, increasing commercial and residential um, composting by improving the ease and effectiveness of our existing curbside program through the right sizing of composting and yard waste bins, establishing composting as an opt out rather than an opt in service, increasing education programs and requiring certain high organic um, content businesses to participate in composting. And the goal is to increase the number of eligible households participating from the current 19% to 75% over the next five years and encourage, encourage composting in the commercial sector through incentives and regulations. And the final recommendation in this area is pay for parking. So establishing a pay to park requirement in the downtown area to encourage low carbon forms of transportation, including public transit, biking and walking. Uh, there wouldn't need to be measures put in place to avoid disproportionate impacts on low income and mobility impaired residents. And there's also a, an acknowledgement that this recommendation would probably likely need to be put on hold during the COVID pandemic due to the current impact on downtown businesses. Next slide, please. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Francie Jaffe and the Just Transition Plan Committee members to talk to you about equitable climate action. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Mayor and City Council, I'm Francie Jaffe, Water Conservation and Sustainability Specialist. And in this section, I will be focusing on how equity can be used as a lens and has been used as a lens to apply to climate action. I will start with a kind of a history and overview um, of equity, and then I'll be joined by two members of the Just Transition Plan Committee, Eric Prieto and Garrett Chapel, to walk through their recommendations. I'd just like to give uh, the City Council and Mayor a heads up that these slides will mostly be bilingual, so they're going to be a little bit more text heavy, and I'll go into why that is later in the presentation. Next slide. Equity has been at the forefront of our community and a need to create a more equitable community. The Climate Action Task Force, when developing their recommendations, worked to select recommendations that had both a high climate impact and a high positive e equity impact. And the resolution stated that's important to engage communities that are disproportionately impacted um, by climate change, also known as frontline communities when developing uh, climate action. The importance of this is important for creating more impactful uh, recommendations that impact all members of our community. For example, as the climate warms, there are expected to be an increase in high heat days in Longmont. This could be especially detrimental for those who both have an underlying metal con condition and have, um, do not have access to adequate cooling. So to create a climate action strategy that also mitigate this potential health risk, it's important to understand and address those barriers. Next slide. 
part of how to do this is through a process called a just transition, which is involves increasing inclusive engagement recommendations and practices for climate action, community health, as I highlighted in my previous example, basic needs, as if you're having trouble affording housing, it could be hard to participate in climate action programs, and jobs as highlighted by the Climate Action Task Force recommendation, it's important to create equitable access to new green jobs. Next slide. The just transition process has been guided by two city resolutions. The first one was in 2018 to transition to 100% renewable energy, which called for the city shall consider the needs of lower income residents that kicked off the just transition plan process. Then more recently, the climate emergency resolution stated that frontline communities must actively participate in the planning, decision making and implementation of climate action, which transitioned the focus of the just transition process to from just the transition to 100% renewable energy to equitable climate action. Next slide. So the logistics of how we've been working to do this is last summer, we distributed a survey and 10 listening sessions to learn where we are today. The results of that are included in the appendix of the report. And then more recently, last fall, we started working on developing policy and program recommendations that can be brought before city council. And that's where the Just Transition Plan Committee comes in. Next slide. So in this section, I will begin with giving an overview of the Just Transition Plan Committee and then Garrett and Eric will join me later to share their recommendations. And just to restate the Climate Action Task Force recommendations were more the what, and these recommendations are more of a how um, you can apply these, a how of how you can apply these recommendations and increase equity um, in the recommendations so they reach all members of the community. Next slide. So as you've noticed, um, these slides have become much more text heavy and also in Spanish. The reason we are doing this is because we practice language justice within the group. We wanted participants of the group to be able to choose the language that they are most comfortable speaking and, and presenting in. And we wanted to continue that practice for this presentation. Next slide. Um, just a quick overview of the group. We had eight residents and three staff that are listed on this slide. Next. Um, the group uh, met for a total of eight meetings, similar to the Climate Action Task Force over a span of six months. And their goal was to develop an equitable climate action definition, use an equity lens and advise the Climate Action Task Force. So I'm now going to transition it over to the two Just Transition Plan Committee members. I'm gonna start with Eric Prieto and he's going to start with the equitable climate action definition, next. Okay. I believe you're still. Am, am I mute? We can hear you. Okay. Thank you, everybody, and uh, hello. This is um this is the definition we came up with, and it's in Spanish and English. And let me read it in Spanish. It's uh, it's um, acción climática equitativa, plan, uh, programa local y cambio de hábitos que reducen la contaminación relacionada con el clima y refuerza la la capacidad de adaptación en la comunidad sin producir daño, apoyando a todas las comunidades en base a sus necesidades. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, before we start, um, we, uh, we added um, the COVID part in the presentation and we have to, we would like to highlight the, that the Hispanic communities uh, represent 13.8 of uh, Builder, Boulder's County's population. But right now we have 38.7% uh, uh, of cases and that has been uh, uh, our latest update. So, and uh, we have to make sure to engage our communities. So can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, right now we have uh, the two broad categories the equity assessment, the overarching equitable action recommendations. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, this, uh, this recommendation, the, it, it's about um, 
evaluating the as essentially evaluating evaluating equity. Can we roll, can we go to the next slide? Um, so we have uh, in this section we are uh, highlighting overarching equitable climate action recommendations. And can we go to the next slide? Oh, okay. Um, the, here we have uh, the marketing on the outreach. And this is, uh, we have some of the examples of how to engage the community. And uh, some of the examples would be um, building nonprofit and partnerships or or creating a, creating a targeted outreach. Can we go to the next slide, please? And the data research, it's about uh, understanding the, the community needs. And uh, this, this, um, well, this, the rest of the recommendations we have it explained by Yara Chapel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Thank um, you. Can I get the next slide, please? So once we have access to the community-wide data, we will be able to identify potential barriers or issues as to why people may not be able to participate in the programs, uh, issues going all the way from citizenship status to potentially how would they be hindered if there was an emergency, if they were engaging with this program. Um, next slide. We, we do also wanna take a moment to recognize that some workers in our community will be displaced by some of these actions, specifically in the oil and gas industry. So it's just further, uh, more of a priority to make sure that we develop some job training and workforce development that is very equitable and accessible to the full community. Next slide. We need to understand how the community's health and safety will intersect with these programs. Uh, a good example of this is trying to recognize that a lot of renters may not have full autonomy over how their living space is conducted or how the health and safety in their home is enacted because of uh, situations with their landlords. Next slide. And then uh, another thing that would be an extra burden to, to renters would be if the program is encouraging building upgrades or anything in that vein, would the cost be eventually passed down from the landlords to the renters? And would there be any extra burdens because of this? Uh, obviously we don't want people having to choose between supporting these climate actions and trying to pay the rent. Next slide. We would also like to recommend that action should be taken not only on the large city level, but on the micro level, uh, closer to the individual neighborhoods and communities to build that kind of personal resilience and that uh, self-reliance within the coming crises. Next slide. And then lastly, something I know that uh, has been brought up a few times is how how are we gonna deal with this if there are potential budget shortfalls? Um, how can we ensure that these programs still happen? So it would be our recommendation that we do focus on probably the, the people more at need uh, in the lower income areas, but then also potentially adopt a pay as you go program or mimic something from an adopt a park or adopt a highway system that local businesses could partake in or even other affluent uh, community members. So this is the end of our recommendations. Um, I would like to thank the, the mayor and the council members for letting us speak and I will turn it over to Lisa Noblock for further discussion. Thank you all so much. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. 
So that concludes all of the recommendations brought forth by both the Climate Action Task Force and the Just Transition Plan Committee. And now I wanna take some time for discussion and get some direction from council on how you all wanna move forward. Um, next slide, please. Oh. Did, sorry, did we wanna? No, just go, just, I was just say, go, go ahead. I was just gonna say, are you calling for questions now or do you have additional, I see seven more slides. <laughs> yeah, so I have, I'll go through if, if there's if we want to take a moment to stop and if there's clarifying questions, but I have a, a number of questions to get direction on council. Yeah, let, let, let's go with that and then we'll we'll come back to the individual questions from council. Sounds good. Okay, so first, first of all, as I mentioned last week, we'll be taking the Climate Action Task Force recommendations to advisory boards in July and August. And I'd like to know what type of information and feedback is most useful for you to come back from those boards. And when would you like to see that information come back to you? And I do want to note that uh, the July meeting for CRAB was, ca was canceled, so we won't be able to go to them until August. So I want to make sure that that timing is taken into consideration. So I'll put that question forth to Council. Okay, so let's go back. Can, can I have the screen back, please? And so if you have, so format and timing is what we're responding to briefly. So if you'd like to provide your opinion on format and timing, let's start with that. Councilmember Christensen, do you have an opinion on that? Um, let, Mar uh, let Marcia speak first. I'm just gonna go through everybody on my screen. So my question is, do you have an opinion on that or no? Oh yes, I have a lot of opinions. That's why I'm letting Marcia speak first, okay? Okay, Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Polly. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, the first thing is um, that regardless of, of um, what the, the boards say, um, I would like us to possibly accept now the Just Transition uh, team's report because they um, have described a way of approaching all of the projects recommended by the Climate Action Task Force rather than additional recommendations um, were doing different things. Um, and so uh, I think it would be good to, uh, uh, to just us as a council say, yes, we're gonna, we're going to look at it this way. We aren't going to leave people out. We aren't going to leave people behind. And we are going to consider social equity when we make changes. Um, so that's my first recommendation. In terms of, of format and what was the other one? I you mean, want, Lisa, timing. OK, so, so timing, I, th I think. Uh, it is really important and um, that we can look at the individual recommendations in time to uh, assign a budgeting uh, priority to some of the early items on it. Um, and I've read all of these recommendations had input on most of them. And uh, what we've got is they have timelines that extend from between three and four years to 15 years. Um, and they need to get they need to get started or at least plan for a plan level of starting uh, in in the years that are uh, that would belong on the city's comprehensive plan. Um, so I would like to see all of the recommendations, uh, unless some end up being rejected, placed on the city's comprehension, con <laughs> comprehensive plan um, uh, in, in, uh, uh, so they don't get lost and, and in time for uh, the prioritized budgeting exercise for next year to include them. Um, and so that really speaks to the format, which means that they need to be by big recommendation on the comprehensive plan and 
um, interim goals stretched out by year. All right, so is there anyone who has anything different or something to add to what Councilmember Martin just said? Councilmember Christensen? Yes, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the Climate Action Task Force. This is a really uh, large, detailed, uh, cohesive piece of work. Uh, it's, um, I think it's an excellent piece of work, despite the fact that I disagree with a great deal of it. I do not disagree, of course, with the uh, intent of it. We must do something about <laughs> climate action, otherwise we won't be here. Um, I have numerous problems with it, and I would like us to, I don't know whether any of these meetings have been open, but I haven't been aware of when they take place. I would like to attend some of these meetings and I'd like to be able to give some feedback in detail over this 200 page report, close to 200 page report. There are many, many things I have profound disagreements with. The most basic thing I have a disagreement with or a, or a problem with say, is the term frontline communities, which I looked all over here to find the definition of that. And I finally found it, I think, on. Page 21, it refers to low and middle income communities, and it includes, well, anybody who'd be affected by it, which is low and middle income communities, the elderly, the disabled, people of color, uh, basically 80% of the town. So I'm wondering how useful that terminology is. Let me just read you, and I keep doing this, but people keep ignoring me, <clears throat> statistics from the American Community Survey and from um, ARP and from the American Community Survey, remember, comes out every year, and the US Census comes out every 10 years. The average, uh, the, the median per capita income in my zone, my, my um, zip code is $28,653. Uh, Longmont as a whole is about $6,000. More than that, it's, this is the median per capita income, $34,440. Uh, I'm sure that there were some people on this um, task force committee who made something like that, but it doesn't sound to me like they were. Um, and the reason it's, in, it's critical to talk about per capita income is that we perpetually get reports that give us uh, Boulder County, unbroken down, Boulder County income, which is, you know, is about 15 or $20,000 more per capita than Longmont. So, and then uh, we talk about household income. Household income is really not what we need to be talking about because it's, this is, the demographics have changed. Only 20% of the population is a standard nuclear family now. This has totally changed from the last, over the last 50 years. 28% uh, of people are living alone and 48% of adults are single. We need to be talking about per capita income. That's the only meaningful way that we can understand this. And by that per capita income, almost everybody in the city, <laughs> about 80% of the people in the city would qualify as frontline communities. So how is this a meaningful term for talking about equity? We, if the majority, is elderly, disabled, low income to moderate income, then breaking this out in terms of equity, I mean, it, obviously we need to be making sure that these things are not affecting people, but they are going to affect most people in this town and we need to own up to that. And we need to be thinking about what we're gonna do for that. So I, I don't want to accept the, um, equity thing, even though, of course, I am all for equity. 
and inclusion for everyone. But to me, it's not, it's not meaningful because you're talking about most of Longmont which is a low to moderate income town. Just like the United States, by the way, Longmont pretty much tracks uh, income wise with the median income of the United States. So we keep getting things from the Labor Bureau, which are averages and their household income. And the Labor Bureau is statistics from employers. It has nothing to do with employees. So we need to be using the right measurements and we need to be talking about the reality of this town. So um, I would like us to be able to have more input on this before we just okay it. Um, I think there are numerous problems with some of these recommendations. And I don't want to, you know, we don't have time to discuss these tonight. So I would, <laughs> we don't, you know, we need a special session just for this. We've had two sessions, but mostly they've been the presentation, which is good. We need to do that, but we need to be able to discuss it amongst ourselves. Thank you. Mr. Martin? Yeah, I think that, that there is a, a misunderstanding of the forest and trees uh, sort in the way council member Christensen is interpreting the um, intent of both um, the just transition committee's report and the way that the recommendations of the climate action task force are structured in every case both in terms of intent and in terms of specific recommendations um, they're set up so that regardless of what percentile you are in in the community, um, the, these things have to be implemented uh, in such a way that they do not make people without the agency to decide where they fall on the spectrum of investment in renewable energy are not harmed um, by the transition. So that means if you're going to take natural gas out of uh, a community, whether it is a block by block thing, or whether it is a neighborhood by neighborhood thing, or a new development thing, for example, then we have to find ways to um, implement subsidies for the people who can't uh, afford to do it on their own. Plenty of people who can afford to do it on their own are already doing it on their own. Um, and we, you know, we, we need to acknowledge and thank those people, not disincentivize them from doing that because they are well to do. Um, we, you know, we don't want to uh, interpret equity that way, um, but rather make sure that when we make an absolute change, we do it in such a way that people aren't worse off than they were before. And I think if, I mean, maybe we need to take a, uh, a look at the recommendations of the Just Transition Committee and make sure that that's what it really means rather than looking at the terms that it introduces. And if that's the case, if everybody agrees with that, then I will withdraw my motion that we just uh, uh, adopt that as a starting point. But that's what it means to me and I think that the people who were here speaking about it would agree that that's what it means to them too. Lisa, maybe you can speak to that. Does, is that what it means to you that when we make one of these changes, we have to do it in such a way that people who don't have the agency to afford it themselves are not harmed, are not worse off? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll let Francie jump in too if she has anything to add because she was much more deeply involved in the Just Transition Plan Committee. But yeah, so if you go back to their equitable climate action definition, it's very much focused on making sure that there's no harm being done in, in while, while making uh, progress on climate action. And in the recommendations that they developed and the, the equity lens tool that they developed that we utilized with a couple of the Climate Action Task Force recommendations, we didn't have the time to run 
every single recommendation that the Climate Action Task Force came up with through that, through that um, assessment that they developed was identifying who could potentially be impacted and in what way, and if those are potential negative impacts, what are the measures that can be put in place to, to mitigate those? Um, so that's, yeah, that's exactly, exactly right. Nancy, do you wanna add anything to that? Um, this is Francie Water Conservation Sustainability Specialist. No, Lisa, I, I uh, believe you covered it. And if you look at the recommendations, a lot of the recommendations are phrased as questions and questions you should consider when implementing climate action. So it, it, again, it's, it's a lot like a, a lens that you can use to kind of reach to make sure that folks are not being harmed and that all are being benefited. And I, I just want to quickly speak to the term frontline communities. So I know that that's uh, probably a newer term. It's a term that's pretty commonly used now in the world of sustainability and climate action, particularly in this realm of um, climate justice and equity work. And it's really trying to get at looking at those that are most impacted by climate change impacts as well as compounding factors. So other um, systemic inequities that, you know, we've been seeing in terms of um, COVID and economic justice issues and all of those sorts of things. So it's really those folks that are being most impacted really across the spectrum. And as Garrett mentioned, part of their recommendations are focusing on, uh, especially when we're looking at how do we prioritize recommendations, if we have constrained budgets or whatever it might be, to focus first on those folks with the most needs. So uh, although I recognize that, that, yeah, I think that there's a large portion of the population that you could say are considered frontline communities, uh, I think what that says is that, that the impacts due to climate change are going to be vast across our community, and that also speaks to the need for um, much greater community engagement to make sure that we are, we are getting this right as we move into implementation. All right, let me just jump, or I'm just gonna jump, so. Uh, I still have the floor, Mayor, I believe. No, no you don't. I asked I, a question. No, I, no I, I'll, I'll hold this, hold on, I get it, okay? So my question is, before we go on there, the, uh, the, the real question is, I mean, we are not going to solve climate, climate change tonight. And I did hear, so the real question is, there's, there's, there's two paths to go down. Um, accept it and let staff continue or have a special session wherein we get together and have this conversation. And so my question is, just raise a hand, how many people here would want to have a special session to discuss this particular issue? I see Polly and I see Joan. How many do not want to have a special session to address this issue? One, two, three, four, five five to two. All right. So what I would recommend is just knowing how people are feeling and thinking is we're going to call in Dr. Waters. Okay. And then Marsha, I'm going to come back to you and just go ahead and make a motion. Is that okay? All right. Dr. Waters. Uh, well, I was, or you can make a motion. Dr. Well, Waters. I wasn't going to make a motion. I was responding. I think I'm going to respond to the question about format and timely. I thought that's what we were asked. We were. All right. So, um, I just so I I just want to be clear. Uh, first of all, I want to like Councilmember Christensen thank the, the there are a lot of good people who did a lot of hard work and thoughtful work on this, both on what we received last what last week and what we got tonight. So, uh, good on everybody who made the commitment. I know it was a, a lot of work to do under under challenging circumstances. Uh, we got a. We, we, these are both interesting sets of of recommendations. Last week, we got, um, uh, you know, uh, organized by kind of sectors or uh, uh, not themes, but um, areas of, of potential impact or uh, remedy, I guess. I'm not certain what language you all apply to it. Uh, I, I didn't see, la I saw areas to be to, of work and opportunities. I didn't see uh, anything that was a measurable goal that I recall. I did see a template in the appendices for a SMART goal. My, my assumption when we looked last Tuesday at this was that the next phase of work would be to take that template and actually develop goals with timelines and performance targets uh, in response to that set of recommendations. Um, tonight, we saw recommendations that were, were 
collections of activities. Um, I, was, I was looking at that thinking, are these supposed to be strategies to help accomplish what we saw last week? I understand it's with an equity lens. These are activities, not strategies, uh, to ensure that what we do in those areas from electrifying everything to uh, water conservation, et cetera, that we saw last week, uh, that those would be th these would be the activities that would help us bring an equity lens as we set smart goals. Um, help me with in terms of format. If you want me to, if you want my vote ultimately to support something, I'm going to want to know that there are number one. We're going to be able to measure and put timelines and budget numbers to, to goals we're trying to accomplish in the, what we saw last week, and that these are activities to help us accomplish those with an eye towards frontline communities and disproportionate impacts, et cetera. It, 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 how do I interpret, I don't know if this, I guess it's to Lisa. I, by the way, I, I, I think Marsha's idea of, of ultimately seeing this reflected in the, in the comprehensive plan is a good one. That's where this ought to be codified eventually so we don't lose track of it. But when we do it, I, I'd like to know, Lisa, are we gonna see measurable goals? Are you gonna use that template? And then are, so you, got, you got my question. Yeah, so that template was used, and if you look, I know it's a long document in the in the main body of the Climate Action Task Force itself. It goes through each of those, we call them topic areas, so building energy use, adaptation resilience, et cetera, and each of those recommendations has a SMART goal that was developed along with it. So the Climate Action Task Force did that work of doing the templates, and they came up with those SMART goals that to the best of their abilities, depending on the recommendations themselves, had uh, goals that were measurable, that were time bound, um, that were specific. Uh, I'll go back and look. I, I, if that's the case, I, I simply looked at the template. I, I didn't pay enough attention to the, to the specific SMART goals in each of those topical areas. So I'll go back and look. And so, can, can well, I, I say, oh, go ahead, Marcia, sorry. Go ahead, Councilman Martin. I would Martin. like to, yeah. to, to speak to the way to read the recommendations. Um, if you think about, as essentially, we the, the Climate Action Task Force took on the entire breadth of a transition to a, a zero carbon society um, in a, a, a three month project. So you were not going to get a breakdown of the individual um, rec milestones in the individual recommendations into um, a, a project management sort of measurable goals. And it would not be reasonable to expect to read it that way. Um, the concept of, of putting pins in the comprehensive plan um, will work this way. What you have in those SMART goals is our timelines with milestones. A milestone might be the city should have two pilot projects for distributed energy resources taken from um, a list of possible technologically feasible projects. Okay, so you put those on the comprehensive plan when they go onto the comprehensive plan, the staff is going to work them and come back with pro project proposals. And those project proposals will have in-depth measurable goals or we won't pass them and we won't fund them on the budget. But um, you can't have the expectation that a 15 year beneficial electrification plan is going to have measurable goals at each milestone. All you can expect in the SMART goals is here are the milestones and we're gonna drill down to the next level at the next step in the process. And so what you should be looking at now, if you wanna say, no, we can't adopt this plan is are these at a gross level the wrong things to do? Should we not try to electrify our city and get rid of natural gas in 15 years? Should we not continue to push our generation and transmission electricity provider to make the transition to renewable energy? Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do. 
All right, I've got a, I've got a suggestion. Is it, we'll go to council member Peck after this, I guess, is it possible to get the questions? I mean, there's seven of us. Many of us are opinionated and have different opinions. Um, and and uh, we, we literally could spend decades on this particular topic. Would it be possible to get the questions and then we can respond in email saying what we each think should be the format, the timing and whatever else you need us to do? Because um, it would be hard enough if we stick to the questions, but we are going to invariably be, be driven by by passion on this particular issue, I think, and, and get sidetracked. Is, is that an appropriate uh, way to communicate our thoughts and feelings on this particular issue? Because like, like I, for example, don't have a particular passion or, or opinion on format or timing. I'd leave that up to staff, but uh, Councilor Christensen and Councilor Martin have differing opinions on that, et cetera. And I'm just wondering if it would be better, time better served to for those of us who, who, are, who care to to, to, to to draft an email responding to your questions, Lisa. Would that work? Yeah, and I, I can quickly run through the remainder of the slides that, that have all those questions as part of them. And then, you know, we can follow up at the, at the end if there's any remaining questions that people want to ask as far as discussion. Let, let's let, let's do that and then also so go through the questions and then i'd ask could you send us an email after the meeting or, or in the morning with the questions prompting us to respond could you do that yeah okay let's go through the questions and the council member pack before we do this your hand was up yes thank you mayor Backley. i was going to respond to the timeline in format uh, which was actually what we were, you know, to uh, agree with with Councilman Waters. That was what this discussion was going to be about. And should it go to the uh, boards, the advisory boards? And um, I think it should go to the advisory boards. I had a question about a lot of these timelines and, um, you know, to uh, to keep it at a, at a reasonable time um, amount of time, uh, discussion time. I'm not going to go through all the timelines, but there are many areas in this um, that the task force has uh, put out. There's many areas in this, uh, oh gosh, it is late, in this document that I would like input from the boards on. And I would also like input as far as the uh, format goes, um, how, how soon can we get a report back from the individual staff members that are working on specific segments of this report and, as part of the format? And that, that, hasn't, that timeline hasn't been established. I, I would like to know um, how fast we can get questions. And I also want to know if uh, how the council is going to measure the implementation of these recommendations. What is our uh, what is what is our goals? What are our uh, timelines for for all of this? I I don't know. I I just think there's too much information here just to pass it on first response. I, that's why I I wanted a a session to actually talk about it. Um, so I so I I want it to go to the boards and. For, for their feedback. Um, I, I want something from staff who is going to be working on the different segments of this and what is their, how soon can they get back to us? Is it gonna be for, for their report on how they're working on it? And are we going to meet the timelines that have been set up? Um, so I don't think that I wanna just pass it on first response here. Uh, I, I would like, first of all, to get the feedback from the boards. So hopefully that made sense. I'm very frustrated with, with this whole thing that we aren't really discussing it uh, in depth. And I do not want to just answer the questions by email because we don't hear what the other council people have to say. Um, that gets to be breaks the sunshine law if we're, 
if we're all just answering Lisa's and I have no idea what anybody else is saying. My, my understanding is that these questions are process rather than substance. And I'm not advocating we have a, have a discussion. I'm just trying to, I mean, this will go forever. And so I'm just, so given that five of us don't want to have a special session, two of us do. No, I, that, I understand that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to look at how to, how to get us to a point where we can have that discussion. discussion. So I, go ahead. Sorry, you still have the floor. I know. Um, I, I don't want to do it by email. I want to hear what the rest of the counselors have to say. So I'm, I'm against that idea. Councilor Martin. I, I still think that this is a, a misinterpretation of what these recommendations are supposed to do. There cannot possibly be staff members assigned to every recommendation. It will take 15 years to assign staff members to some of these recommendations. This is a roadmap. It's not like saying, um, are we going to um, update our land use codes in 2022 based on some recommendation from Europe. You know, this is not where you can staff it person by person and point by point. This is, are we going to make a commitment to energy management? Are we going to make a commitment to load shifting? Are we going to make a commitment um, to reconditioning our soil so that uh, it sequesters more carbon. You know, those are not things that anyone on the city staff, with a couple of exceptions because they're interested in it, can talk about now. And that's but, not what I meant. So you're misinterpreting me. So um, I would actually at some that was an interruption, Council Member Peck. Yeah, all right, hold on, hold on, hold on, time out. I'm gonna I'm gonna take the floor back now. So the uh, unless somebody really says, Mayor, we're we're totally in disagreement. I'm gonna have Lisa Knobloch go through and give us the questions so we can think about them. Um, we're going to give staff our input based on the questions. We'll send it via email, and then we will have a discussion. Um, after staff gets the process questions answered. And um, let, let's just go with that, see how it works. Because um, uh, I don't want people to get, I mean, we're all on the same team, meaning we all want to address this particular topic and have it done as, as, as good as possible. And so we just need to get these, let's get staff these answers and then we can get ready for, for putting our heads together to figure out how we can make it the best, best process possible. So Lisa, why don't you go ahead and just give us our, throw up the slides and let's see what those questions are. Yes, uh, Mayor Bagley and council members. Uh, so the, the first uh, set of questions is focusing on what type of, of feedback and information do you want from the boards and what, what timing do you want from that given that uh, the, the last board presentation will be August 10th. Uh, next slide, please. The next question is on the, the governance section. So if you recall from last week's presentation, again, I, I know it was late, but as a reminder, uh, the Climate Action Task Force uh, wanted some form of, of accountability or oversight in terms of implementation of the, the Climate Action Task Force recommendations. And they're recommending that that oversight uh, be and progress reporting be incorporated into the scope of the Sustainability Advisory Board. Uh, with the formation of ad hoc technical committees as needed to support specific implementation of specific recommendations, uh, and then also incorporate climate action recommendations into the council work plan. So the second set of questions is on the governance piece is, are you okay with that approach or do you have any other additional thoughts or questions in terms of addressing governance? Uh, next slide. Uh, re frequency and format of reporting itself. So I think this gets to um, what I understood, I think was council member Peck's question around uh, when staff can bring back reporting on progress of the different uh, topic areas and recommendations. And that's really a, a question that I wanted to bring to you all. So the resolution, the climate emergency resolution, it notes that quarterly reports will be brought to council uh, after the initial report is completed. So is that the frequency that makes sense for you all? And in terms of formatting, we already do provide quarterly reports on the implementation 
of the strategies within the sustainability plan. And there are a number of recommendations from the Climate Action Task Force that are already in the sustainability plan that are just expansion of some of those uh, strategies. So we could very easily incorporate that into that existing reporting process and find a way to highlight specifically the climate action recommendations, because I know right now it's just a big long spreadsheet and we can find a way that, that pulls those out more um, specifically or if you want a different reporting process. Uh, next slide. So you can skip this slide and then the next slide. I don't need to go into that right now. And then one go to one more, Susan. Great, and then really the final um, bulk of this section is really, first of all, are there any recommendations that council doesn't want to support pursuing at all? Uh, so that's one That's one piece. And then the, the approach that, that really we think makes the most sense in terms of the next um, phase of reporting or in next phase of implementation is to ideally complete a prioritization process of the recommendations through dialogue and interaction with the advisory boards as discussed, as well as broader um, public through the broader public through the community engagement process. Um, so that's been spoken to a couple of times that there needs to be greater engagement um, before we really prioritize the recommendations and then do that further planning and analysis that needs to be done to understand uh, more deeply the, the fiscal and community impacts of implementation. And uh, so, so that's really the question of, are you good with that being our next step? Uh, and then the final question is, is council supportive of staff continuing to work with the Just Transition Plan Committee through the implementation process. So as you've seen tonight, the Just Transition Plan Committee has really been invaluable in providing guidance and perspective to ensure uh, that as we move through climate action, it's done in an equitable way. Um, and we, we would like to continue that process. So those, those are the questions that I am putting forth to you all for direction on. All right, so what I'm, what I'm proposing then is the email goes out, we respond, and then could you please uh, condense those responses, send them back to council, and then we'll put them on a future agenda to address those issues where there is disagreement. Is anybody in opposition to that plan? Councilmember Martin? Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I think that, that there is a problem with the idea that the projects in these recommendations are different in somehow and will remain different somehow from the other projects that the city takes on. So, you know, once they are on the council work plan and the comprehensive plan, um, because those things are different, right? The, the council work plan makes policy changes and starts initiatives, but, but when something is like build a, a, a solar, a community solar garden, that's not a council work plan thing anymore. It's a comprehensive plan thing, just like widening a street is. And so the idea that we would um, leave all of these climate action task force recommendations separate from the city, the regular processes that the city goes through um, just doesn't make sense to me. And it makes it sound like way more work than it really is, because there's this some this idea of of keeping these things separate all of this time. Um, you know, so what what really needs to happen is, yeah, we need to have a final review after hearing from the boards that says um, we think we need to pull this recommendation out, or we think we need to pull this recommendation sooner in time than the task force recommended, some things like that, that's, that's the purview of the advisory boards. Um, but once things make it to the, to, the, to the comprehensive plan, then they're treated like any other city project. And that's when they are sub subject to the process metrics that Dr. Waters is talking about. But not now, this is policy and concept. And so I think that we need to compress this whole project uh, and look at it with um, 
a, a different kind of a lens. We need to, uh, for one thing, we need we need to look at at um, uh, the social equity lens that that's been explained, and we just need to decide. Well, you know. That's going to be part of priority based budgeting heretofore. Maybe we can't implement that change until 2021 or 2022, but that's our goal. Everything the city does should happen through the equity lens, and it's going to matter a lot for some things, and it's going to matter hardly at all for other things. Um, but, but we cannot just decide that everything from the Climate Action Task Force is a separate project that's going to be evaluated and staffed separately because it's special because the Climate Action Task Force came up with it. Most of these things are things that the city would have had to do anyway, and we should treat them like that. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Martin. So, okay, Councilmember Waters. Uh, thanks, Mayor Bagley. So I, I just want to, Lisa, as I'm scrolling through last week's materials, I see pages 40 through 83, where that, that collection of, uh, of what were proposed as goals uh, can be found. So I, I see it there. Um, uh, are you going to want reactions to those uh, in, 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 you just asked a series of questions. One of them was, what, what are we going to support this? There's a, there's a ton there to digest. I understand what Councilman Martin just talked about, that it's got to get folded into the comprehensive plan and then treated like, like every other recommendation. Uh, one of the differences is that, that not everything in the comprehensive plan had the same kind of urgency as a crisis uh, as, as these recommendations. Um, the one other piece to this, and, I, and maybe it's not for us to worry about because in the priority-based budgeting process is where it'll be handled. Um, in all those recommendations, uh, even as I'm scrolling through them, wondering about which of the, what's going to be the impact in terms of reducing carbon footprint uh, at, at what cost over what period of time as a way to score, kind of like we would be scoring these in the priority-based budgeting process. Um, uh, that's a whole different level of analysis as I look at these to think, and I'm certain I don't have enough knowledge in many of them to, to be able to score them, but somebody does. Uh, so at some point in time, that's going to be helpful as well in terms of ultimately blessing these or how we're going to handle them. I'm certain there's not a recommendation here that's not a good one. Uh, you people put a lot of thought into this. Um, I'm just trying to wrap my head around uh, what's the action we take. I guess it would be for me then the action we take after we hear from boards with some idea of how it gets folded into the comprehensive plan. And at some point in time, some understanding of how we're gonna, how we're gonna score these recommendations based on their impact on the climate or reducing carbon at what cost. And then we can see what kind of timeframes we have in here. All right, so I'm gonna, okay. So I'm gonna actually uh, ask a question and, uh, and that is of Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. I see all these hands go, we could do this all night. And if you guys want to do that, that's fine. Um, but I'm going to probably bow out and say I'm getting the sniffles or something. But Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, um, what, uh, what do you think we should do? I've proposed an idea. Um, how do you, what format do you think it, we should follow going forward? Because I noticed there's a couple of us who were just silent here tonight. And I want to know what you are thinking. What do you want? What do you think we should do to resolve and answer the questions of, of staff tonight? And what process do you think we should move going forward to most effectively and expeditiously tackle this topic? Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. You know, I kind of got the impression when I read the report as well that it seemed to be very high level to me in the concepts uh, that were presented. And, and there was not the level of specificity that I think we need to quote unquote make the sausage with right now. Um, I think there's still, you know, some more work as far as getting some more input is concerned, but outside of that, so in, in as far as what was originally asked, um, I was fine with the schedule as far as when they were presenting to boards and then my answer to when would that be 
brought back to council, you know, an ASAP is kind of my answer to that as well, not knowing exactly how long it will take to compile after the August 10th meeting. Um, but going back to what I started with as far as it being kind of a high level thing, it sounds to me like regardless of what we're doing, it's going to have to be dug in at uh, vast, uh, you know, detail as far as incorporating it policy wise. And that's going to take, I'm assuming, multiple chunks going forward, as opposed to, for instance, thinking that we're going to approve this one report and then, you know, the machine's working uh, on autopilot at that point. So that's kind of where I stand as far as our motions, you know, as far as our, our way forward, our path to proceed with this. And I don't mind the, the email portion as long as with, I believe you had, you added that the council responses would be sent back to all the other council members. I think that that is important as well. So, same question to you, Councilman Ridago Ferring. What, what, what do you think moving forward, what we need to do to be able to move forward expeditiously and effectively? Well, you know, I guess I really wanted to know if we um, direct staff to proceed to the next phase, but and so they're able to continue the work, but then in the meantime, we're getting the, you know, we can direct. So you come back to us and give us a more detailed account of what is happening with um, specifics in regard to targets and goals and what your, what, what, and timeline. So then you come back to that and then we can make recommendations throughout the process. Is that something that's feasible? So then we are not holding up the program, but we can provide input throughout the process. Does that make sense? Harold, and so that question ties into the same question I asked both Mayor Pro Tem and Council Member Idago Faring. So please answer what please answer that. Can you do what Council Member Idago Faring just said? And the same question for you. How do you want us to move forward? So I think the I'm going to touch on a couple of things. Think of it as an inverse pyramid. Mm -hmm. We're up here, and this is pretty high level. And so we need to take it to the boards and commissions to get their feedback and input. Mm -hmm. And then that was Lisa's first question. Here's the timeline on those dates. We will consolidate that input, and then we'll bring it back to the council to go, here's what all the boards and commissions said. And I think the question was, do you, do you want to have another presentation or do you want that in an informational item? So then we're going to update you on that piece once we, we take care of that. Then Lisa's next question is, is that as we look to the future in terms of governance, do you want that to sit with the sustainability advisory board? Give us the ability to have ad hoc technical committees or whatever the other piece was. What was the, I lost the third question. Incorporating the recommendations into the council work plan. Council work plan and comp plan. So the answer is council could say today, we want you to go to boards and commissions and we want you to bring that recommendation back. And then we'll look at the next set of questions once we see that and we can bite it incrementally. Or you could say, we just want to answer all of this now. Does so that answer the question? So that is what you're Councilor, that all fair? That answer your question? You know, it did. I guess what I envisioned is that we were going to be discussing the overall, you know, looking at what the recommendations are. If we are in alignment with, if we are in agreement with what they've recommended, let's move over to the next phase. That's where I, the board piece. Then they yeah. come together, figure it out, and then they're presenting, they're walking us through the process. I guess that's what I was envisioning. Am I correct? And that's that's one question in there. Okay. Um, yes. And I, I have the slides, so. Yeah, I would like to see it in that format, but I don't want to delay any progress in the plan by just having us all reconvene to discuss this at mass. Does that make? Yeah. I'm I'm actually going to make a motion. I actually move that we rather than doing the email. Yeah. I'm actually going to move that we actually ask that Her Harold and Lisa give us a proposal moving forward yes. and then we can respond uh, to their proposal because 
we've got seven people and I, I don't see any of us coming to any type of agreement on, and I really think that the staff is best qualified to actually give us at least a starting point. Councilmember Christensen. I was going to suggest that I think what you suggested, Brian, is a good idea. I also was going to suggest that, you know, just for the opportunity to have some input, that Lisa send us those questions and that we respond to her and that way we can read them at our own leisure and uh, we all have a chance to respond however lengthy we want to. Um, but Lisa, if you send us, if we do do that, would you please send us the slides that you did because we don't have those. Um, um, yeah, I just don't want to rubber stamp things and have them go forward. I mean, we have very specific recommendations like all parking downtown needs to be for pay. Uh, people need to, you know, we have some very specific <laughs> recommendations in this and, um, I wouldn't, I just want it to go to all the boards and the boards that were suggested so that they have their ability to input, give us input and give the uh, climate sustainability or the climate task force feedback too. Um, that's why they're advisory boards. Um, anyway, um, so I would suggest that we do both, uh, but I, uh, you know, I have a lot of faith in Harold and Lisa, of course. Right, so, so, so. so here, here's, I'm gonna redo my motion. The motion is, I move that we ask Lisa to send us the questions. We all have the opportunity to respond in whatever way we feel appropriate. And that Harold, Lisa and staff take those responses and provide us with a proposal as to how to move forward, at which point we'll put it on agenda and talk about ways that we do, may or may not disagree or how to tweak it. That is my motion, do I have a second? I'll second it if you let me talk. I, uh, Councilor Martin, I will let you talk. Thank you. Then I second it. Uh, there's something that I think everybody's missing out on, which is that the recommendations of the Climate Action Task Force are not a project. They are recommendations for dozens of projects, which are to be considered by this council and by the staff individually in the future as we proceed with turning this into a sustainable community, turning Longmont into a sustainable community. But everybody is trying to treat this as though it's this huge, gigantic, unmanageable project, and it isn't. So once the boards have said, you know, I mean, what's the board's going to say? They're going to say the same thing as the Climate Action Task Force. They're going to say, we like community solar gardens. Let's put that on the comp plan. Or they're going to say, community solar gardens are going to be obsolete in two years. We should pull that off and not do that one, not put that on the list. But that's the entire level at which these recommendations need to be considered. And we don't need the kind of deep dive that seems to be, we keep returning to, because we'll take that deep dive when we come to it in the comprehensive plan. And, and, I, and if, Warren, if that I, can't, if we can't get our heads around that, then I don't know how we're gonna make any progress. Well, and I, and I'm, I, I personally am trying to get us there. And so we've got a motion and we've got a second and let's go ahead and vote on it and get this thing moving. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, motion passes unanimously. We're moving forward with our cli climate task force plan. That's awesome. All right, let's go ahead and go with mayor and council comments. Mayor, can I do something real quick? Absolutely, Harold. I think one of the issues we want to be true to the work that the climate action committee did and what you've done is now, we we will frame it in what we were hearing today in terms of working through those pieces and, and breaking it in into its functional chunks to help answer many of these questions. Awesome. And we'll just stay true to what the Climate Action Committee has developed. Okay, thank you, Harold. All right, Mayor and Council comments? Council Member Christensen. Uh, 
of the museum is open again. Yay! So go to the museum. And everybody try to be kinder to each other and try to keep the community in mind and do the right thing. Wear your mask, wash your hands, stop being so mean to each other. It's really gotten quite ugly in the last few weeks. So thanks. Amen to that one. Anybody else? All right. City manager, any remarks, Harold? Uh, no remarks, Mayor Council. I did um, um, send you all an email if you'll make sure to check that out regarding me this week. Great. We saw that. Okay. At least some of us did. All right. Uh, Eugene, are you even here? There he is. Still here, Mayor. No comments. All right. Great. Well, thank you very much, guys. And I will see you all later. And we are actually, do we have a motion to adjourn? Sorry. Can we just adjourn by consensus? Anyone opposed to adjourning? All right, we are adjourned. All right, good night, guys.